Is it okay? No. You could just have to open it. Test. No, okay. Ne mogu da lakše. Hello, good, good morning. It's time to, to begin the new session. Uh, we have the pleasure this morning to hear first uh, Matthias Sormani, who will speak about hydrodynamics of the innermost one kilo parts. Thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, I wrote some lecture notes because uh, uh, I think there were too many uh, details of the calculations that I couldn't put in the slides. So the idea is that in the slides, I just give you as much detail as is uh, needed to understand the big picture. And then if you want the details, you can look up the notes. So they are uh, both on the conference website or on the overleaf if you want the, the source or whatever. Okay. So what I really talk about is the, the formation of nuclear rings, which of course are typically in the innermost one kiloparsec of, uh, of galaxies. So let's uh, start with some uh, examples. Uh, this is uh, NGC 1097. Uh, you have seen it in many talks already. And at the center has this uh, very nice uh, nuclear ring. Uh, a nuclear disk, of course. So when I talk about the nuclear ring, I just mean uh, the gas part. And when I say nuclear disk, I mean the, the stellar part. Okay. 
So <clears throat> uh, what I want to understand is how the how how is this for? What is the dynamical process that forms this uh, gas ring here? Uh, just a few more examples. This is NGC 1512. Uh, uh, Fang's collaboration has observed it uh, also with uh, James Webb, uh, where you can see the, the ring uh, very nicely. This is uh, 1300, also a very uh, nice ring. And uh, uh, the Milky Way also has a, a ring uh, kind of like this. It's called the Central Molecular Zone, and we see it edge on because we are uh, inside the Milky Way. So uh, this is what it, it looks like, but it's something like this. Okay. So <clears throat> the nuclear rings are actually very easy to form in simulations. This was found already many years ago by, by Leah, for example, who ran these uh, simulations here. Um, and the recipe is quite simple. You just take some gas uh, in an external bar potential you don't need to do any fancy physics. You can take it to dimensional. You can ignore star formation. You can ignore the gas self-gravity. You can ignore many things. And uh, more or less spontaneously, you form uh, rings such as in these examples. Uh, the resemblance to observation is quite striking if you compare this to the barred galaxies I've shown before. So it looks like the uh, essential physics of the formation of the rings is, is captured by these simulations. However, my proposition is that watching the simulations doesn't mean that we understand how the ring is forming. If we watch it, like we know the, what are the key ingredients, but we don't understand the dynamical me mechanism just by watching uh, the movie of the simulation. So, <clears throat> What I want to understand is how the rings form, what determines the radius, for example. Why is it at this uh, location and not at twice this radius or half this radius and so on? Okay. And uh, there have been various theories over the years proposed for this. Uh, my claim is that uh, they're, uh, they're all wrong. Uh, <laughs> but before I tell you, <laughs> so I'll try to convince you of that now. Before discussing uh, why, I want to establish five conditions which I think uh, any plausible theory should uh, satisfy. Okay, so <clears throat> the idea is that you can take these simulations as numerical experiments, change the parameters, you see some dependencies on these parameters, and then you say, okay, whatever theory I come up with, I want uh, the theory to uh, satisfy the same uh, uh, dependencies on the parameters. For example, uh, here is a ring in some simulations by Lee et al. And uh, he tried to decrease the, the rotation curve while leaving all the rest more or less the same in the simulation. And what he sees is that uh, as I decrease the central concentration of the rotation curve, so I decrease the, uh, the amount of mass in the very center, uh, the ring uh, uh, shrinks. Okay, so... My first condition is that the radius of the nuclear ring should somehow depend on the, on the rotation curve of the, of the galaxy. Then I say, okay, let's keep the rotation curve fixed. By rotation curve, I mean only the axisymmetric part of the gravitational potential. So let's do a multiple expansion of the potential. I keep the axisymmetric part fixed and I change only the, the non-axisymmetric part. The most important is the quadrupole. So let's change only the quadrupole. Uh, does the, the ring change? Well, yes. Here it's uh, some experiments I did some time ago. So I, I keep the, the axisymmetric part fixed. I increase the strength of the quadrupole and the, the ring uh, shrinks. Okay. Condition two, the radius should depend also on the non-axisymmetric part of the potential, not just on the, uh, <clears throat> on the rotation curve. Okay. Then <clears throat> what about the, the pattern speed of the bar? So, so far I talked only about the, uh, the shape of the gravitational potential. I didn't say anything about how fast the bar rota rotates. So let's try to increase the bar pattern speed and see how the ring changes. Again, uh, an example from Lee et al. Uh, you see that the ring shrinks as I increase the bar pattern speed. So third condition, the radius of the ring should depend on the pattern speed of the potential as well. Okay, so <clears throat> the, 
The fourth condition is, I think, the most important one and the one that has been ignored uh, in most, in all theories uh, so far. Um, and is that even if you keep the, exactly the same gravitational potential and you run one of these simple simulations where you don't have any fancy physics and you assume that the gas is isothermal, uh, there is one parameter in the equation of state, which is the, the sound speed. So you assume the pressure is proportional to the sound speed square times the, the density. Um, you can try to change this one parameter. So everything else is the same. And what you see is that uh, the size of the ring can change and actually can change quite dramatically because you see here in the left example, the sound speed is five kilometers per second. Then in the middle is 10 kilometers per second and is much smaller. And then if it's 20 kilometers per second, it's even smaller. So this is nothing new. Uh, Panos already found this with Leah in, uh, to, in the year 2000. Then many people saw the same thing. And um, I think it's quite surprising because if you think about it, the sound speed is always much smaller than the orbital velocity. The orbital velocity here is order to 200 kilometers per second. And then you change sound speed from five to 10, you think this is still negligible with uh, respect to the orbital sound speed. But in reality, it makes a big difference. So uh, <laughs> the, the, the condition four, which I think we, we should pay a lot of attention to is that the radius of the ring also must depend on the equation of state of the gas, not only on the gravitational potential. Okay, uh, this is just another example, uh, some tests uh, that I made. Uh, uh, so just look at the last column on the right. Uh, each row is a different sound speed and you see that from 20 to, to one kilometers per second, uh, the size of the final ring changes uh, quite a lot. And finally, my last condition is that the radius of the ring is somehow determined locally, not globally. What do I mean? I mean, take uh, like a, a full disk simulation like this one on the, on the left. I run the simulation and I end up with a, with a ring and then with the bar and the bar lengths, etc. Very good. Then, I run the same simulation, but I start with uh, a smaller disk. So my initial density distribution is all contained within the inner Lindbad resonance. So I don't have all the, the bar shocks, uh, the X1 orbits. There is nothing about uh, that. Uh, I let the simulation run. And what happens is that the, 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 this disk shrinks and the final ring that you get is very similar to the ring that you get with the full simulation. Here is a bit smaller just because there is a more gas coming in the, in the big simulations, but the final size that you get is, is the same. So uh, my condition is, it's not very important what happens with the X1 orbits, what happens outside the inner limbed resonance. You, you have to find some local reason why the, uh, the ring has that size. You can see, so this is the experiments where uh, uh, which I was mentioning, where I start with a disk already inside the, the, the Limbrad resonance. The dashed circle here is the Limbrad resonance. So at t equals zero, I have this disk here, uh, which is already contained within the Limbrad resonance. Then I turn on the bar potential and I see the, the evolution in time. All the simulations are identical, same potential, except the sound speed. And what you see is that the sound speed is high. You get these spirals, which are, um, have a large pitch angle. And then the disk shrinks until you get this. When the sound speed is larger, the spirals are more tightly wound. You get a larger ring and so on. Okay. So in summary, what I want is that the size of the nuclear ring depends on both the gravitational potential and the equation of state of the gas, and it is determined locally. So let's now look at the previous theories and how they do compared to these uh, conditions that I laid out. So I think the most uh, popular theory in the extragalactic community especially is the resonant theory, which says that the ring forms at the Limbrad resonance uh, under the continuous action of torques 
from the bar potential. Okay, so the prediction is the ring is at the resonance, but this clearly violates the equation of uh, <laughs> the equation of state condition, the sound speed, because if I change the sound speed, the potential is exactly the same, the resonance is exactly at the same point, but the ring uh, radius changes. So <clears throat> uh, this condition is violated. Also for the Milky Way, which is the galaxy in which we have the most precise measurements of the, of the potential in this region, we can clearly see that the, the radius of the ILR is uh, much bigger than the radius of the, of the central molecular zone ring. So, <clears throat> okay. Another theory that was proposed uh, uh, by Leschetal for the first time and then uh, independently rediscovered more recently by uh, Kramholz and Kreussen uh, is inspired by an analogy with the viscous accretion disks. So, you know, if you have a viscous accretion disk, uh, here is the standard uh, uh, example from the review of Pringle 81. If you start with uh, a very peaked uh, distribution and then uh, you have viscosity, it spreads. Okay. Um, and this is the basis of the, of the Shakura and Sunyayev alpha model of accretion disks. And <clears throat> uh, so the idea was like, okay, in this theory, the transport of mass is proportional um, to, the, uh, to the shear, and the shear is uh, uh, from the rotation curve. So if the rotation curve changes such that I have positions where the shear is very low, the transport is uh, uh, less efficient and the gas accumulate, piles up for, for a while there and then moves away, but the, piling, the temporary piling up is, uh, is the ring. Uh, well, okay, nice, but uh, it violates essentially all conditions because according to this theory, the, the radius of the ring is just uh, determined by the rotation curve. There is no pattern speed, there is no, nothing. So <clears throat> then uh, in 2018, I wrote this paper, um, which I said, maybe if you have a, a non axisymmetric orbits and you still in the framework of the viscose theory, you can get some uh, regions where um, the shear actually works in the opposite direction. So instead of spreading a ring, it kind of make it, makes it um, uh, thinner. <laughs> so the fact that it's real, I, I have done some, uh, some tests. So here you can see, so this is the end of the simulation compared to the beginning. You see that the inner ring spreads like in the normal viscous theory, but the outer ring doesn't. So I thought, okay, maybe, so maybe the outer ring is the nuclear ring. It doesn't spread because of this effect. Uh, but I think it's, mm, it's not good because it violates the, uh, the equation of state condition again. So mm, don't read my paper from 2018. Okay, so uh, how do the nuclear rings form then? Let's start again from scratch. Let's watch a movie of their formation. So here I have one of these simple simulations again, and uh, I start with an axisymmetric disk, and then I slowly turn on the bar potential. And what I see is that, okay, let's go at the beginning. So here the potential is axisymmetric. Now starts to be a little bit non-axisymmetric, and you see, I form these spirals. At the beginning, the spirals are, are quite weak, like here, you, you barely see them. Uh, then they get stronger. I want you to notice that the spirals are only inside the inner limbad resonance. When you move outside, they become to uh, fade and they become, become uh, evanescent. And then out here, you don't really get uh, any spirals. Then as you wait, the bar potential gets stronger and stronger. It becomes very nonlinear. The underlying potential starts having X1, X2 orbit, which Panos described uh, already in detail. You get this. Uh, now the bar has stopped growing. So I have the, the bar potential is, is, uh, is not uh, becoming stronger anymore. This is the flow. The ring keeps shrinking until it reaches like a, a final size. 
Uh, and once it has the final size, you can continue the simulation for quite a long time and you will not see much change. Okay. So <clears throat> if you plot the azimuthally averaged surface density as a function of radius in the same simulation that I showed in the, in the movie, you get something like this. At time zero, it's flat. That's my initial condition. I wait some time, so 300 mega years, and you see that if I look at the Limbrad resonance, there is a, a gap, and all the material that was in the gap has moved here. Then I wait even more time, the gap has widened, so it's it become much bigger, and all the gas that was in the gap is here in this peak. So this peak is the nuclear ring. Uh, and this gap here is all the area between the ring and the outer disk, which is, uh, you know, has many names. Uh, let's look at it again. So here is the big peak and the, the region here is, is the gap. You see there, there is almost no gas anymore there. Okay, so um, uh, let's draw a few considerations from, from this. So the first important consideration is that waves, spiral waves are somehow involved. You saw them at the beginning. The second is that the gas accumulates inside the inner Limbrad resonance, not at the Limbrad resonance. We can neglect the gas self-gravity, was not there, the star formation and feedback, magnetic fields, the multi-phase nature of the ISM, all these things were not in the simulation that I showed you. But we must include an external bar potential <laughs> and hydrodynamics. So less, less than these, uh, we, <laughs> we cannot have. Okay. So now I have to take a, a long digression to, to discuss waves, because that's what I think turned out to be the most important uh, concept. So <clears throat> essentially the rotating bar potential generates wave in the gas disk. It's, uh, you, have, you can imagine it uh, like the bar uh, as a giant spoon in the galaxy, <laughs> it's steering the galaxy <laughs> and it's producing these waves. So we need to understand the generation and the propagation of these waves uh, by the bar potential. Because the bar potential is hard, uh, I took a long time to understand how it actually works. Let's start with a simpler problem, uh, a toy problem that has many analogies with the, with the actual problem. So let's first understand the toy problem and then we move on to the, to the, to the real problem. So the toy problem is this, consider uh, a 1D gas, homogeneous, uh, and a one dimensional oscillating external Gaussian potential. So, oh, Okay, so this is potential as a function of x coordinate and time is a constant, just the strength of the potential times uh, a Gaussian. Uh, X zero is the, the width of the Gaussian. Uh, and then in time, it oscillates like uh, e to the omega zero t. So omega zero is, is an imposed frequency. You have a imposed frequency of the potential, it oscillates as a Gaussian. Okay. So the starting equations are <clears throat> uh, very basic. Is, so the continuity equation, everybody has seen this. The Euler equation, uh, again, one dimensional, where here I have the force from the external bar potential. And then I assume an isothermal equation of state. So the pressure is proportional to the density. And here I have the sound speed squared. Sound speed is a constant. You can't get something easier than this. Then what you want to do is to study waves in the linear approximation because the nonlinear uh, is very hard. So you take the homogeneous state where uh, rho zero is constant and everything is at rest and you linearize the equation of motion around it. So density is rho zero plus rho one, 
velocity is v1, you substitute this into the uh, equation of motion, and you, you keep only the first order in the quantities with one. And then uh, you Fourier expand also, so you write all variables as a, a function of x times uh, exponential of minus i omega t. So this is all standard uh, to study to study waves. Um, because you are in the linear approximation, each mode will evolve independently. There is no interaction between the different modes. Okay, so you do some algebra. Uh, uh, okay, so you do some algebra and eventually you get to this equation. The algebra is in the nodes. Um, so what, look at this equation. Uh, C is just a dimensionless X. S1 is just a dimensionless density. A and B are dimensionless parameters, which are combination of the basic parameters of the problem. So you have X0, CS, omega zero. This is all constants that are uh, in the setup. And Q <coughs> is a forcing potential. So if you look, so the, the Q depends on the, on the Gaussian potential. So if you look at this equation, it's very familiar because this part is just a harmonic oscillator, right? And this part is just a forcing term of the harmonic oscillator. So when you have no forcing term, so the, the, you, the, the Gaussian potential is turned off, what you get is simply standard sound waves. You just have to solve the harmonic oscillator, you get standard sound waves, you get the dispersion relation, which is omega equals sound speed times k, uh, very basic physics that everybody has seen in year one or something like that. When Q is not zero, you get forced waves. Uh, and turns out that for this Gaussian potential, you can solve the problem uh, exactly, analytically. Uh, what boundary conditions you have to impose? You have to impose the radiation boundary condition. So you have the potential in the middle, and then at infinity, the potential is zero. And you want at infinity, the waves must, must be moving only away from the potential. They're not coming in from infinity towards the center. This is the same uh, boundary condition when you derive a retarded potential in electro, uh, electromagnetism or many other medial field fields. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so you, you solve the problem exactly and you can calculate the amplitude uh, at infinity of the waves that are excited by the potential. And it turns out to be this formula here. Uh, the parameter B is just, a, is essentially the strength of the potential. So the, the strength of the waves is proportional to the strength of the potential that you have imposed. Okay, this is uh, expected. The other term is not so trivial and uh, it's this, depends on this parameter A if you look at A, is essentially the ratio between the scale length of the potential, x0, so that was the width of the Gaussian, to Cs over omega zero, which is just the, uh, the dispersion relation of the, of the, uh, of the sound waves um, at the frequency of the imposed potential. So this is the wavelength of the sound waves at the frequency of the external potential. And what you get is when, um, well, if you take the sound speed much, so the, the curve A, it looks like this. It has a peak at A equals square root of six. This is where you get the maximum excitation of waves. And then it goes to zero at infinity and at zero. What does that mean? That means that the amplitude of the excited waves uh, is maximum when X zero and this wavelength are of the same order. If you take the sound speed too high or too small, then the sound speed, the, 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 they don't resonate and the excited waves become very small. Okay, this is technical, but now I show you with movies what I, what I mean. So just to understand better. So here uh, you have the Gaussian potential in the middle. The Gaussian potential has width one. Okay, in all these movies that I'm showing, the Gaussian potential is with one. And I take sound speed uh, one and a small bar, uh, not bar, uh, Gaussian potential. Okay, so uh, 
I have, you know, here the potential is oscillating, is making waves and the waves move away. Very good. Uh, the analytical and numerical solutions agree very well. Everything is, uh, is fine. Okay. Now let's change the sound speed and I keep the same potential, same everything. I take half of the sound speed. So you see uh, <clears throat> that the wavelength has halved because that's the dispersion relation. And this is the waves that I, that I get. Okay, let's halve the sound speed again. You see that the potential is the same. The strength of the potential is the same. The width of the potential is the same, uh, but the waves has become smaller. I decrease again the sound speed and I get this. <laughs> I tell you that even if you wait, you will not get any waves. There are no waves. Why? Because the, the sounds, the wavelength is too small to the, it doesn't couple, it doesn't couple to the external Gaussian potential because the wavelength of the waves is too different from the scale length of the potential. So they don't couple, they don't talk. There are no excited waves. This is just a transient, uh, doesn't matter, but okay, trust me. Then of course I can try to make the potential stronger. What happens if I make the potential stronger? Well, the linear approximation breaks down at some point because uh, the sound waves steepen and they become shocks. They become nonlinear and then shocks. So you can see it here. Uh, near the center, they are sinusoidal. And then as they move to the right, they steepen and they become shocks in the simulation. Of course, in the linear approximation, you don't see that. Okay. So what's the key lesson that we get from the toy model? The key lesson is that you can excite waves efficiently when the scale length of the forcing, or the, of the external forcing, is comparable to the wavelength of the sound waves, which is quite uh, reasonable intuitively also. So let's go back to the galaxies. Okay. Uh, consider uh, a rigidly rotating uh, external bar potential, which has the following form. This is the simplest uh, bar potential that you can imagine. It's composed by a monopole, uh, which gives you the rotation curve, which is here. You see it's a very simple rotation curve from the logarithmic potential, and a quadrupole, which is the most important term in a bar. Uh, the details uh, are in the notes again, but for the monopole, I take the logarithmic potential. For the quadrupole, I take uh, some analytical potential that was too long to write here. And uh, you can calculate where the resonances are. You make this uh, omega and omega minus kappa, uh, plus and minus kappa diagrams. And you find that there is an inner limbrad resonance here rotation is here, outer limbrad resonance is here, and so on. Okay, so the details of what, um, so the, 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 what I say in the next uh, slides is more or less general, but I use one uh, specific potential just to, to be concrete, so it's easier to, to follow uh, what I say. Okay, so now you have the starting equations, which are the same equations, of the simple simulations that do reproduce the nuclear rings. So you have the continuity equation. This time is not one dimensional, is, is two dimensional. The Euler equation, you have the external potential here. And again, the isothermal equation of state. You do the same exercise, you linearize the equations around uh, the background state. This time the background state uh, is a rotating gas disk uh, in equilibrium, axisymmetric. So you take an axisymmetric gas disk, you linearize the equations uh, around the state. Then <clears throat> you expand uh, with Fourier in uh, ang angular. So you have um, polar uh, cylindrical coordinates, polar coordinates. You expand in theta and in time. And in R, you... you you cannot expand with Fourier because the coefficients of the resulting equations depend on R, but they don't depend on theta and time. Okay. 
you do some algebra. <laughs> uh, at the moment, it's not too important the algebra because uh, it's it's straightforward but a bit uh, cumbersome. Eventually, you arrive at an equation like this. <clears throat> so the only approximation to get this equation is the linear approximation. There is nothing else. Okay. So we are still um, similar to the toy problem because all we did was linearize the equations of motion. How, how does this equation look? So G1 is uh, the density of, with some change of variables. Okay, so it's, <laughs> it's related to the density. Uh, is, again, in the toy problem, we had this, a similar equation. We had, uh, here we had the dimensionless density. Here is renormalized with some coefficients, but it doesn't matter. Uh, Let's say it's the density. So the, on the left, you have something which is like a harmonic oscillator, but the coefficient here is variable. So it's not constant. So it's not really a harmonic oscillator, OK? And then you have a forcing term here. The forcing term depends on, on the external bar potential and also on the density profile of your uh, background equilibrium disk. Okay, so Q is a complicated expression which contains the potential, the bar potential, um, the, the rho zero, so the uh, background uh, density and so on. Okay. So this is quite similar to the equation of the toy problem except that K is variable. So <clears throat> let's analyze this equation. Let's first consider the case Q equals zero, no forcing. So what are we doing when we do this? We are studying free waves that are propagating on the gas disk, right? There is no external force. It's just, I have the gas disk. I touch it here and there. There will be waves generating. The waves propagate in the disk. Uh, we will get something which is a more complicated version of the sound waves in air, but they're more complicated because the disk is rotating, uh, there's a lot of other things going on, okay. So if you plot the, the, the kappa, the coefficient of the equation for the potential that I showed before, you get something like this. And <clears throat> so where kappa squared is positive, you do get waves. So you get an equation which is basically, you can solve with the WKB approximation, and you get, uh, you get waves, which are more complicated uh, sound waves. Where kappa squared is negative, it means that uh, uh, you don't get sinusoidal uh, solutions, you get exponential solutions. So they either grow to infinity or they decay. So essentially is, a, is an absorbing medium. You don't get waves. You get, it's like when you have uh, electromagnetic waves, you send them into a material which is absorbing. They don't propagate inside the material. They just make an exponential tail uh, and they die. And then you have these uh, uh, special locations, let's say, which is around the, the resonances. And around the resonances, uh, you need to do a separate treatment. So uh, in all these um, parts, you can do the WKB. It works very well. Uh, even when there are no waves, you can do the WKB and you get the exponential uh, solutions, fine. But around the resonances, the WKB uh, doesn't work. You have to do a separate thing. OK, so the wave solutions away from the resonances look like this. So you have a solution which is locally proportional to exponential of IKR. So this is, for example, uh, an exact solution of the, of the equation. You see the Nimbrad resonance is about here to the, to the right at 1.6 something. Um, yes, and you do get these waves, the amplitude is uh, ch changing with radius, the uh, wavelength is changing with radius, um, but locally uh, there is a definite wavelength and it's, it's like the toy problem more or less. K, so the K that you get in the equation, which is the long expression, you can interpret it as the local wave number of these oscillations. By the way, at this point, if you wish, you could already calculate the pitch angle of these spiral waves because uh, you just use the K 
the K depends on the potential on the sound spin or a few other things. So if you want, you can already predict the pitch angle of the simulations that I showed at the beginning. That you can already do. What you cannot do yet is the amplitude. Okay. What happens when I add the forcing term? So now Q is not zero, there is a bar potential. Where do I excite the waves in my gas disk? On, under what conditions do I excite the waves? We can apply the key lesson that we learned from the toy problem. The waves are excited efficiently when the wavelength of the sound waves, which here is one over K essentially, becomes comparable to the scale length of the forcing. Right? In the toy problem, uh, K was constant. So for some values of the sound speed, I get, mm, mm, I excite uh, large waves and for others, I don't excite anything. Here, K is changing with radius. So at some radii, I will have that the scale, scale length of the forcing term becomes closer, close to one over K and then I excite big waves. And some other radius, I get one over K is much smaller, for example. Uh, and so at those radius, I don't really excite much waves. <clears throat> so you can, uh, you can plot the one over K for different um, potential, but more importantly in this, uh, in this lecture, for different density profiles of the background disk. So here I take a uniform background disk, okay? And then I plot the one over K and uh, a parameter which tells me the scale length over which the, the forcing term uh, changes. So that's just Q divided by dQ dr. This has a dimension of, of radius. It's the scale length over which Q changes. And you see that here, so here is the inbred resonance, the, uh, the red uh, dashed line. Here, the dashed is much larger than the solid line. So here, I don't excite any waves. If you calculate it, they are negligible. They are 10 to the minus uh, 10 in amplitude. Don't care. Here, they become comparable. Where do they become comparable? Near the resonance. Because near the resonance, one over K goes to infinity. It doesn't happen, happen at the, exactly at the resonance, actually. It happens a little bit before, where there is this turning point, which is where K goes to zero, and so one over K goes to, to infinity. So near the resonance, you can excite big waves. That's the first location where you excite the waves. The second case, when you can excite waves, which uh, took me a long time to understand, is when you have a sharp edge in your background uh, disk. So if I take a, a gas disk, which is not uniform, but has a profile which is constant, you can see it here, then goes down, and then is constant again, I have it's a, a truncated disk. Here I have an edge. At the edge, this uh, uh, scale length for Q becomes very large because the Q also depends on rho zero. So if you have rho zero varying on that scale, Q will also vary on the same scale. And, uh, and what can happen is that the one over K becomes comparable again to this, and they couple. And when they couple, you get waves. Just a comment to say, what do I exactly mean by sharp here? Because sharp is zero. So sharp means uh, the edge must be of the order of the one over K. So of the order of the waves that I want to excite, which is quite reasonable, right? It's, if the edge is becomes of the order of the waves, then it can couple to the external potential and I get the waves. Uh, if it's not reasonable, you can look at the math and you see the same uh, uh, result. <laughs> okay, so in summary, there are essentially two places where you can excite the waves in a gas disk. 
near the resonance at, at sharp edges. Everywhere else, the excited waves are negligible. What you, so what you have is the bar potential is rotating in the gas disk. It's like a giant spoon. But this giant spoon doesn't make waves everywhere. It makes waves only at specific radii, at the resonances, and if you have a sharp edge. Everywhere else, the gas disk doesn't really care too much. Good. You do more calculations, and you can get um, the, the amplitude and the angular momentum flux of the waves that are excited at these two locations. So at the resonance, this was done in a very famous paper by Goldrick and Tremaine in 79. At the sharp edge, actually, Goldrick and Tremaine has a comment about this. It says also sh sharp edges also. <laughs> but they don't, uh, maybe for Goldrack it was obvious, but for me it took five pages of calculations. Uh, so um, you can get a formula which works at the, at the edge. Uh, and uh, it's actually quite similar, right? There is only this part which is, which is different. Uh, these coefficients depend on the background state on all the potential all the things that you assume, but that, don't focus too much. They are quite similar and they become the same when you are one wavelength away from the resonance. So essentially, within one wavelength of the resonance, you should use the Goldrake formula. If you have a sharp edge, which is more than one wavelength, then you should use this formula instead. And at one wavelength, they become equal, okay? So this is the angular momentum flux that is, uh, going into the waves and uh, it's negative. So the waves have negative angular momentum. In other words, they don't, the, the gas disk donates some angular momentum to the bar uh, and decreases its own uh, angular momentum. Okay. So, now I talked a lot about waves and I want to put all I said so far together to build a picture for the formation of, of the rings. So let's consider again an, an idealized setup. You start from a uniform gas disk. Initially there is no bar potential like in the simulations. And then you start turning on the bar potential. What happens? You can um, schematically imagine uh, two stages for the formation of the ring. So in the first stage, you, there is no sharp edge. There is just a uniform density distribution. And therefore you will have strong waves excited near the ring blood resonance, as Goldrake says, and remain. These waves are trailing. You can see, you can calculate that. And if you calculate the group velocity of these waves, which is the direction in which they move radially, it's directed towards the center. So they are excited at the limbrad resonance and they start moving to the center and they have negative angular momentum. If the waves were linear, in the, so if the linear approximation were, uh, was good, uh, the potential is very small, the external bar potential, then the waves would simply travel to the center and then at the center happens whatever uh, your boundary conditions are. Yeah, they get, can get reflected, they can get absorbed, depends. But they travel, but they leave the gas disk undisturbed. But what really happens in reality is that because the bar potential is very strong, they become non-linear very quickly, less than a wavelength. So they start and then boom, they become a giant shock and this giant shock dissipates. So the wave dissipates into the background gas disk. And because it has negative angular momentum, the background gas disk decreases its angular momentum. And so shrinks a bit and a gap opens around the Lindbergh resonance. Okay. <coughs> this process continues. You can uh, estimate the velocity of the edge by using the angular momentum uh, flux 
uh, formula. Of course, you estimate it in the linear approximation. The actual process is very nonlinear, so you will get maybe the order of magnitude right, but not the details. And uh, the typical time scale is, uh, you know, 30 mega years or something like that, which is more or less what you see also in the simulation. Uh, so this continues until when? Until the gap width is approximately one wavelength from the ILR. At that point, uh, the analysis of Goldrick and Tremain doesn't work anymore because uh, it assumes essentially that the background density is smooth and uh, it, 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 it works within one wavelength. If you look at how the approximation is, is done, it works within one wavelength of the, of the resonance. So when the gap has that size, <clears throat> what you have is um, you must have a truncated disk, right? You have a disk which was uniform at the beginning. Now there is a gap around the limbrad resonance. So there is an edge between the, the center and the, and the resonance. And this edge must be sharp. Why it must be sharp? Because sharp means of the order of one wavelength. But now the gap is one wavelength. So the edge cannot be longer than you know, one wavelength to the, to the resonance. So it's sharp by definition. And, be, and because it's sharp, you excite trailing waves at this edge. And these waves remove more angular momentum from the gas disk and push the, uh, the, uh, the edge of the, of the disk inwards and the gap becomes wider. You can again calculate the, the speed that you predict this edge to move. Roughly, it coincides with what you see in the simulations. Of course, uh, these calculations again very idealized because it's in the linear approximation. The actual edge is nonlinear. You don't know the exact shape. Uh, the waves are actually super strong shocks, so don't expect too much uh, agreement uh, quantitatively. But qualitatively, yes, you get the same order of magnitude. Okay, so when does the edge stop moving? This is a very difficult question, but essentially uh, it stops moving when the edge is not sharp anymore, or when the, bar when the edge is moved so far that the bar potential there is not strong anymore, so it's axisymmetric. When is it not sharp? Well, it's not sharp when it can relax, the profile of the edge can relax and become at least a few wavelengths. When it's become a few wavelengths, then um, you don't excite waves anymore because the forcing term is not comparable to the wavelength anymore. Uh, so to predict this analytically, I couldn't do it, um, but if you look at the simulation, is rule of thumb is between five and 10 wavelengths. So the wavelength you can calculate, if you guess the gap edge will be at between five and 10 wavelengths, you are usually right. It weakly depends on the strength of the bar too, uh, because the forcing of the waves is proportional, but um, is proportional to the bar strength, but not very strongly. So if you, the bar is a bit weaker, the edge stops a little bit sooner because the, the waves excited are a bit uh, less strong for the same uh, profile. Okay, this I said already. So <clears throat> this is just a schematic that summarizes what I said so far. So you have the, the Limbrad resonance here. One wavelength is the near the resonance region where you should use the Goldrick and remain formulas, and it's stage one. Then uh, once the, so this is the edge. Once the edge has moved one wavelength, you enter stage two, let's say, so you have a sharp edge and the edge keeps moving until it stops with some radius here when it's a few wavelengths from the, from the ILR. Okay, so we can, watch the movie again with this insight. So here is the waves excited at the ILR. You can, when they are small, you can match them exactly with the calculations. Then here is the gap opening. The waves, they don't look, they travel inwards because the movie is, um, 
is in the bar rotating frame when everything seems stationary. But if you look at the process radially, uh, there is a transport uh, inwards. Okay. Uh, here the waves are super strong. The edge is very sharp if you look at the profile uh, of the thing. Um, and here is, uh, ah, here is, um, so here is the ring radius as a function of time for simulations with the different uh, sound speed. So you see the larger the sound speed, so CS20, I get a very small ring. Uh, sound speed 10, I get a, a bigger ring. For sound speed 10, it's particularly striking how the size decreases and then it, it, it stops suddenly. So something uh, non-linear must be happening here. I don't understand it. For smaller sound speed is more uh, gradual. For, for sound speed five, you see it kind of a continuous decrease and then flattens out. Uh, and the dashed lines are the predictions from the linear formula that I showed before. So you see, yes, the agreement is bad, <laughs> but qualitatively is, is okay. I like to say at least. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, this theory, does it satisfy all the five conditions we said at the beginning? Yes, it depends on the potential, on the rotation curve, depends on the strength of the power. It depends on the bar pattern speed, but yes, because the, so does the position of the resonance. Uh, depends on the sound speed, yes, because the wavelength of the waves is essentially proportional to the sound speed, like for normal sound speed. So if you uh, increase the sound speed, you double the sound speed, you double the width of the gap. In other words, to, if you want to, and so you, you should not focus on the ring, you should focus on the gap. <laughs> okay. And is the ring radius determined locally? Yes, because the waves are excited locally. They're excited at the ILR or they are excited at the sharp edge. They don't care about the bar lanes uh, far out or whatever you have. Okay, so finally, uh, the last thing I want to say is that <clears throat> all I've said is actually very similar uh, to the opening of uh, uh, gaps in planetary rings. So this was, uh, the basic principle is the same. This was uh, discovered by Goldrick and Tremain, so the, their papers where I take the formulas is, was for this. Uh, so this is a picture of Saturn, of Saturn. You see that there is a gap here. This is called the Cassini division. And uh, the explanation of, uh, of Goldrick and Tremain for the creation of this gap was that there are satellites orbiting around Saturn out here, outside of the ring. And the satellites provide a perturbing potential to the potential of Saturn. So the satellites are like the bar. They are a perturbing potential, which you can expand in multiples and so on. So the equations are actually very, very similar. This uh, potential has resonances. And if you calculate the resonances of a satellite called the uh, MIMAS with the yeah, where, where the, the, the radius of the resonance, the most important resonance is, you find that is exactly here in the middle of the Cassini division. So the idea is that MIMAS excites waves at the resonance, opens the gap. Uh, and it's quite amazing if you look at the images uh, from the Cassini, uh, it's always Cassini, but this is the Cassini spacecraft. So. Uh, so this is a picture, a zoom in picture of the wood during the flyby. And up here, you have the gap. You see that uh, it's cleared out by waves. And at the inner edge of the gap, which would be the nuclear ring for us, there is this accumulation of material. And uh, you see that uh, uh, there are uh, these uh, spikes and uh, these uh, are the shadows of the spikes. So from the shadows, you can measure the height of these. And what it turns out is that the average thickness of the rings here is 10 meters, okay? So like this building, less than this building, is very thin. 
but the thickness of this edge is two kilometers. So it's a giant uh, wall that uh, in this artist impression, so it would look like this, essentially. So this is real because they took pictures. <laughs> Uh, well, this is not a picture, but th this one is a picture and is uh, quite clear. Um, <clears throat> and this edge also is, is dynamic. You don't have to imagine it as a statically. You have to imagine that it's, it's kind of wobbling and moving. So the idea is that the basic process is the same as for the nuclear rings. Of course, there are differences because the Saturn satellites are a very weak perturbation to the gravitational potential, 10 to the minus eight, I don't, I don't remember. The bar is 10% of the axisymmetric potential. So it's much stronger. So what you get is that for a very weak bar potential that would be the, the, the same situation in Saturn, you get a very small gap and then the material accumulates here. So <coughs> then when you make the potential stronger, the gap widens, but also uh, the idea, the idealization that you have an axisymmetric disk and on top of it, you have a P cycle, uh, it starts to break down really. So the background disk also deforms. So if you imagine a continuous sequence from this to the bar, this is what you would see. Uh, here is a small gap, it's almost circular. And when you have a strong bar potential, you have uh, the red is the ring. All this region here is the gap, which is uh, all the region depleted of gas, where you also have the bar dust lanes here, the bar dust lanes would be inside this gap and so on. Uh, and the deformation is because uh, the, the, the potential is, uh, is quite strong. So the bar is a much stronger perturbation than the Saturn satellites. Uh, another difference between the two problems is that the sound speed is actually negligible for Saturn. Uh, and the transport of angular momentum in the case of Saturn is uh, uh, driven by the self-gravity of the waves. While for the nuclear rings, I think is kind of the opposite. Self-gravity, of course, is there, but the main uh, means of transport is um, pressure. So it's, it's more similar to the sound waves. Uh, yes, so self-gravity, I think it can be neglected for, uh, for the nuclear rings, but you cannot neglect it for Saturn. The rings of Saturn are made of, of small rocks, right, of ice and things, so there is no pressure. They just bump into each other and collide, so the pressure is, is very small. There is also an analogy with protoplanetary rings, uh, disks, sorry, protoplanetary disks this time, um, uh, which is why the Goldrick and Tremaine paper uh, are becoming a lot uh, cited in this community lately. So if you have a planet uh, orbiting uh, in a, in a protoplanetary disk around the star, so the, the, it's forming uh, the, the planetary system around it, uh, you form a gap around the planet. And uh, the formulas that people use to calculate this gap are the same, again, uh, of the Goldrick and three main formulas. So it's, it's the same process, it's the same physics uh, with a few variations. Uh, we can discuss the variations if you're interested, but the basic process is the same. Okay, so just a, a few final uh, remarks. What is the relation between all of these and the resonant theory? Because uh, some people say, uh, well, in the end, it's just the same. Yeah, right? You're saying the resonance is the rings. Yes, okay, <laughs> in some sense. But in some other sense, uh, our theory is the opposite of the resonant theory because the resonant theory says the gas accumulates at the resonance. What I say is the exact opposite. The gas is pushed away from the resonance. And the accumulation of this gas pushed away inside the resonance is the ring, okay? Uh, what is the relation between all of what I said and the X2 orbits, which uh, <clears throat> uh, has emerged also in the discussion here with Panos? Uh, 
Well, it's completely consistent because actually, if you look at the calculations, when you solve the, the linear equations, you have the waves and the waves propagate on top of a background disk. Um, when you add the forcing term, the solution of the second order equation, uh, so the solution of any second order equation, you know, is the solution of the homogene, the general solution of the homogeneous equation plus a particular solution of the inhomogeneous. So you can find the particular solution of the inhomogeneous equation, which has non-wave character, okay? And then the full solution is this non-wave solution plus the waves that are travel, that travel on top of this. The non-wave solution looks exactly like the X2 orbit. So this in black is the streamlines of the non-wave solutions. In uh, uh, cyan, dashed is the X2 orbits calculated exactly for the same potential. And you see that they are almost identical. So what, what I'm saying is that these waves I've been talking about, they propagate on top of an X2 gas disk. So the, the gas disk doesn't really move on circular orbit. It moves on these uh, slightly elongated orbits. And this is taken into account also in the linear approximation. It's just not in the background gas disk, but in the non-wave part of the uh, inhomogeneous solution. So my conclusion is, uh, are the nuclear rings at the inner edge of the gap around the Lieberman resonance? So you should focus on the gap, not on the ring. Of course, everybody wants to focus on the rings because they are beautiful, there is star formation and so on. Uh, and I hope at this time I don't come again in five years telling you my paper was not correct, <laughs> don't read it. Thank you. So questions, yes. Thank you for nice, so nice talk and these questions are very really beautiful. So I wonder what's about the stability of these rings because if I see correctly about like tumor parameter, you increase the sound speed, but you also have this gap which proportional, which size proportional to the sound speed. So you transfer the material from the inside the ring, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And thus uh, it's like surface density proportional to the sound speed squared. So the tumor parameter drops and these rings, they should be like gravitational unstable probably. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so in all I've said, I neglected gas self-gravity, right? so it doesn't matter. Um, if you look at the real rings, they have a lot of star formation. So the gas that is coming, it's not just accumulating. When it, it's uh, more than a certain amount, it makes a lot of stars and so it's, it's consumed. Um, in depends on the galaxy, but for the Milky Way, uh, the uh, tumor parameter is, uh, is large. So it's, uh, it's not really unstable. If you look at the current state, uh, the total uh, gas mass of the CMZ, of the, so on the ring, is about 5% of the mass of the nuclear disk uh, that, so the nuclear disk is providing the gravitational potential in which the gas moves and the gas is uh, 5%. So it is, so the current is, is not really important, but of course, locally you have a lot of gravitational collapse. The ring can break up into several clouds that then make uh, local star formation. The, 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 I think the, the, the real problem is much more complicated, but what can I can say is that we have run simulations which are simple like this, but also that have all the bells and whistles, the star formation, the uh, self-gravity, the stellar feedback, blah, blah, blah. And the ring size is not really changing a lot. So order of magnitude, uh, okay, this is the basic process. I think it's still probably valid. Uh, then when you have the real galaxy, it's going to change. Uh, also, the magnetic fields are going to change the picture because uh, if you add magnetic fields, uh, you have magnetic pressure. And that, if you want to model it very crudely with the isothermal approach, is like increasing a little bit the sound speed. So you increase the sound speed by, by adding the alpha, alpha, and way, uh, alpha and speed in quadrature. 
and you get the ring size, which is more or less what you get in the magnetized simulations. Of course, it will be much more messy if you want to do the same calculation with the magnetic fields. Uh, yeah, because it's not isotropic. And, but yeah. Other questions? Yes. Really nice, Matia. Thank you. So I'm wondering how. So this explains very in a very elegant way how the gas accumulates at the ring from the outside. But it also often seems that there is something pushing the gas outwards into the ring from, like there's an empty space often in the inner regions as well. Sometimes there's not a disk, but just the ring. So is, is that somehow incorporated here or not? Um, so you mean from the ring to the, to the center? Or, More or, from the or, center. Or... Out it's often there's often like a, not a disc in the center sometimes sometimes there's a, a disc of gas but sometimes it's just like a ring and very little gas yes in their parts um so i think f things moving out it's probably a different process so it can be uh, radiation from stars or uh, uh, an agn at the center or something else this process always mm, is in the direction of bringing the gas down also, this process is very inefficient after the, so it's very efficient in bringing the gas to the ring, but from the ring to the center, you need something uh, different, um, which I, yeah. Could, could shear, like the shear theory be playing a role in accumulating the gas towards the ring from the inside? Yes, I think so, because I think from the ring to the inside, then it becomes much more similar to a standard accretion disk. Uh, so you, you could model it with, you know, the Shakura and Sunya have alpha picture. What is producing the alpha, the magnetic rotational instability? Well, okay, that is a different question. Um, and you see the same in the simulations, but, but also in the observations, like if you take uh, M91, I think, you see that there is a lot of gas in the ring, and then there is a gas disk inside, which is at much lower density. So the efficiency of the process that brings the gas on the ring is, is very high. And then the efficiency from going to the ring to the center is much lower. So you do get some gas, but it's a low surface density disk. Yes. Thanks, Mattia. Very nice. And so did I get it right that you start in the model with a gaseous disk that is already there? And then, and then you start seeing the formation of the ring? Or is the gas coming from, from the bar, from outside? Well, in the simulations, it's mostly coming from outside. It's, it's like, as I said, the gas that was in the gap is taken and put at the, at the ring. Uh, but you should not consider these simulations as representative of what happens in actual galaxies. These are idealized numerical experiments and um, this stage one, stage two picture is only to understand what is happening in this numerical experiment. In a real galaxy, what you have is probably, you start from a gas disk, axisymmetric, at some point the bar forms by buckling instability or something else. During this process, a lot of the gas goes to the center. So it's, it's much more messy. The gas is consumed by the star formation. So the, the survival, the depletion time of the gas is not very long when you see the, the ring now in NGC 1097, that's the gas that has been brought there in the last, I don't know, 15. Yeah, because I would imagine that in a real galaxy, you wouldn't have a lot of gas in the center before the bar is yeah. pushing gas. <clears throat> so you, you start with the gas coming from outside. Yes. And then, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other question is in the, in the simulations, I noticed that the, very quickly the ring has already a, a sizable radius, right? It, so I wonder if you can say anything about the inside out growth of the nuclear disk from the simulations or if, or this is pushing it a bit too much. And then for example, how, what is the time scale? And I, maybe I missed with the time scale in the simulation, how many, how much time? To, to do what? In, how much time in the simulations you show have elapsed? Oh, a few giga years. A few giga years. Uh, well, okay, one one gig doesn't grow so much inside. One giga year. In, inside you mean? In radius. How fast does the ring form? Grows. Okay. Grows. It grows like in radius. Like if you can, if you can talk about the inside out formation scenario. Ah, no, but, but 
uh, I think that's uh, that you cannot see the, because I was confused because the ring doesn't really grow in this simulation, right? It shrinks, it's the opposite. Right, right, right. But that's not representative of, uh, of the evolution because what, what really happens, I think, is in a galaxy formation context, you form the bar. And then when you form the bar, there is no mass at the center. So that's like saying that the limb blood resonance is at zero radius. So the gas moves direct to the center. When you start accumulating mass, then the rotation curve changes and a limb blood resonance appears. And as you accumulate more and more mass, it moves out. And so <clears throat> the ring is inside the resonance, but also follows the resonance. So the ring radius is growing, but it's not growing because the material inside is moving out. Yeah. It's growing because the material inside is gone because of star formation. And the new material that comes in the next uh, generation of stars or whatever is uh, stopping at a larger radius than the gas that came before it. And so the, the ring radius appears to grow, but nothing is moving out. It's just the new gas that is stopping at a larger radius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But we don't see this in the simulation, right? No, no, because here, uh, this is idealized. What you, you see that if you look at the CO et al simulations, for example, and you, you have to have a simulation where the bar properties are also changing. Here, the bar is, uh, is fixed. Okay. Uh, Uh, once these uh, nuclear rings have re relaxed, uh, how do you think uh, they will be influenced if we have a, a gas infall or a flyby intruder by another small galaxy or something else? Hi, it's a good question. Um, I think, um, well, it, you imagine a ring, you pass by and it will pop. <laughs> It will be perturbed and maybe this will trigger some gas inflow to the center. Yes, it's possible. That's a, a question I wanted to, that's why I, I asked him yesterday if you have a, if he has a, a catalog of the orbits of the globular cluster because I want to see if, if there's a globular cluster coming close enough, does it, uh, it will change the... yeah, how does it uh, affect the ring? Yeah. We don't know yet. <laughs> no, I don't know. Okay. Thank you, Matthias, for the talk and also for making available the uh, lecture notes that will be useful for many of us. Uh, you have seen the, the link. Uh, it will be also on our web page. Uh, we can have uh, discussed a lot. I have just a, a few questions, comments. Um, as you know, I'm working in the same field the last years. Uh, first uh, remark I want to do is that uh, there are numerous simulations, response models. There is, uh, they use different potentials, different uh, hydro codes, etc. There is a general agreement, basic stuff. There is also, however, several that find something different described in the same initial conditions. So we have to have in mind that at a degree there must be some model dependency on what we find. Uh, the way I'm always seeing that, well, I was thinking of asking you to put the last transparency, but yeah, please go ahead. No, sorry, I just want to say, yes, of course, here I took a, a specific potential because uh, it's already messy. Uh, if you take a different potential, you can have different, more, more than one resonance, no resonance. Yeah, exactly. So in that case, you, the kappa here will change. You have to see course, what it looks like. Uh, so you can, you can calculate it and then you plot it. And then from its properties, you derive uh, the predictions of what is going to happen, yeah, yeah. like mm, the pitch angle of the spirals, where there can be spirals, because you can see uh, here, I say, ah, here there are waves because the kappa is positive, but when you have more than one resonance, it can go positive, negative, turning points. So at the turning points, you get reflection of waves, it can become more messy. Yeah. That, that, that's true, of course. This is straightforward that a different potential will have different response, of course, especially if it has a different uh, pattern speed. Yeah, okay. Also, what I want to say is also, but 
uh, similar potentials or the same potential in some cases mm -hmm. because people use typical ferrous bars or I don't know uh, different hydro codes lead ah. to something that is not uh, exactly the same is similar there are there are differences that's all uh, if you want uh, uh, if you can uh, uh, to put the very last slides with the orbits uh, so that uh, I can comment on that. This one, yeah. So, uh, in uh, very popular potentials like the first bars and all that stuff, we can uh, see something clearly that the outer, these are X2 orbits, the outermost ones are elliptical like. As you go to the center, they become round. Uh, I like always to, uh, to, to study that in terms of perturbing forces. So this tells us that practically the potential going to the center is almost axisymmetric because the force in term is smaller and smaller and smaller. And this reflects the shape of the orbits there. This is the case in the, uh, uh, our popular potentials. It is, not, and, and also uh, in all these cases, this is the only orbital stuff that you can have down there. There are no other things but uh, X2 and X1 orbits, and there is a last X1 orbit. There is also an area that the two families do not overlap. So uh, this is not the, the case in other potentials. I don't know if there are, uh, uh, let's say, that realistic or not, that those potentials that we estimate from uh, galaxies. Forget about how realistic they are. Uh, the, in these cases, there are other families coexisting there, like the one-to-one -one and uh, bifurcations of it. Sometimes you can have a zoo of uh, orbits there. So I don't know what it is most realistic, but just let me mention that. And I want to say that uh, exactly always thinking like uh, what I expect to see has to do with the forcing, the local forcing. Uh, we see that uh, in all these models, the spirals inside the molecular resonance they are very, very tightly bound. Actually, uh, I'm not quite sure. I checked that uh, if it is they are logarithmic or Archimedean spirals that that, that close, uh, they are very tightly bound. And uh, although uh, observers speak about grand design, inner spirals, or multi arm spirals, or, and all that stuff. The issue is that there is no galaxy that we see all these tightly round spirals inside the central region, not a single object. And I, I don't want to start the discussion about the other thing, the leading spirals now, but we don't have these clear forms. Yeah, yeah, the... but I'm, I'm not surprised because uh... This is all very idealized, but as we said before, you have a star formation, for example, you have a lot of supernovae exploding and the size of a supernova is, uh, can be tens of parsecs, uh, or it disturbs the gas on that. So if it, it's just a big mess and you can see that because if you take the, the simple simulations without stellar feedback, then you see these nice spirals, but then you do the same simulations adding the stellar feedback and you see that it's all destroyed. But if you look at the ring from very far away and you are uh, no glasses, <laughs> okay, then it looks the same as the simple simulations. Uh, I fully mm -hmm. agree with that, but mm -hmm. since it is that intrinsic and we find it in, uh, very easy, I, I would have expected to tell you the truth to see something that say, okay, this is a destroyed nuclear spiral, which actually has not so much, that, I don't know if we can speak about the shocks certainly that are not that strong, like the dust lane shocks, but uh, they are there in all simulations, so a trace of them, I would have expected. I don't find them <laughs> that word. <laughs> so, so. Yeah, I just a um, remark uh, concerning the Euler equations in astrophysics is very popular, but it's self-contradicting uh, model of the interstellar gas because uh, what you assume by using uh, uh, isothermal, but just uh, such a gas, it's a collisional, a very collisional medium with short relaxation time that is, uh, so, and dissipation less. And uh, what you, 
why well, it's self-contradicting because and then it implies infinite Reynolds numbers. So the real solution of the equation should be very turbulent very soon. And as soon as you have a shock wave, you, you see your shock wave is not going to make a double flow or something like that because you have a numerical dissipation. So the, what saves your flows in smooth is numerical viscosity. So there is dissipation anyway. Yes, <laughs> when you have the shocks, yes. You have shocks. And, um, but that's, 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 uh, that's important for the rings because only the way, when the waves become shocks, they can dissipate their angular momentum. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. But it means the, the model is, is not uh, perhaps give you the occasion in five years to, to improve on that. Because <laughs> what I would like to see is, in fact, what we see in the, in, in the image you showed of the, the rings, the, the, the molecular clouds uh, in the dust phase, the molecular clouds, it's a very granular flow. It's not a smooth flow. So it's already uh, semi-collisional, say, if you want. It's not a very collisional medium. And well, as, as you go into the ring, this granular flow forms stars, which it's themselves are no, no longer collisional. So what the parameter that I would like to, to see introduced is the degree of collisionality. This can be done by uh, uh, sticky particles models or perhaps uh, uh, modification of the smooth hydrodynamics, where you control this degree of, of collisions, because uh, I'm sure it's, it's, it's at the basic of the, the physics well, that has, is at play in the industrial media. Yes, no, I, okay. Um, I, I, so the, the isothermal uh, approximation is a very crude approximation. Uh, this is only for understanding, let's say. Uh, but we have run, let's say, ex reasonably expensive simulations uh, with a lot of different physics. So we have uh, tried um, putting a, a cooling function with a non-equilibrium chemical networks on the fly. So that gives you uh, a two-phase medium. And then when you add stellar feedback, you get a three-phase medium. Uh, so we have cold gas, uh, 100 Kelvin warm gas, uh, 10,000 Kelvin, and hot gas, 10 to the 6 Kelvin. It's all mixed up. And then we added also uh, magnetic fields and so on. So what we can see is that you run a simulation turning on some of these ingredients, you get a ring. For example, you turn on more feedback, the gas gets hotter, and you can see the ring shrinks a bit. You turn on the magnetic field, and it also shrinks a bit. You can find an equivalent sound speed that gives you a ring of the same size. But this is a very simple-minded way to like, you have a multi-phase medium, what is the sound speed? There is no sound speed, right? There is a multi-phase medium, but somehow you average over the thermal sound speed of all these media, uh, magnetic pressure and so on. And the net effect just for the size of the ring is equivalent to some value of the sound speed. So, yeah, but in, it's, in it's this a representation. You, you have a, a smooth medium, a different. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I, I, it's, it's different. The collisionality is a, the degree of relaxation, the, the mean free pass, uh, is, is another parameter. That is yes, no, it's true. But um, what is important is the capacity of the medium to propagate waves. Okay. Yeah. And uh, if you have magnetic fields, then you can also have waves. And they propagate, it's, it's not the same, but you can mimic it very, very stupidly with the, with the isothermal sound speed. Uh, and the same, if you have clouds, yes, you have clouds, but they are usually immersed in a, in a diffused low density medium, which can also propagate some of these waves. So, yes. But, but it's, it's, it's a granular flow. It's, it's granular, it's, it's but it, the waves. <laughs> The, the propagation of waves is completely different <laughs> because of diffraction and so, so Completely uh, agree. This is very yeah. idealized, yes. So perhaps... Uh, <laughs> Next time. Still a question? A naive question. Did you elaborate about part when you said that the quadrupole part of the bar potential, quadrupole part is the most important one 
because I think when we try to decompose or apply Fourier transformation to the actual part, we always end up with the dipole part, quadrupole part, and higher order of components. So maybe I missed it. Do you take only the quadrupole part in your simulation so you use some higher order? I have a, yes, I just have the quadrupole. But I tried um, to decompose some main body bars, yes. uh, and you see that uh, yeah, the quadrupole is large, and then the next term, which would be the, the octopole. Uh, but the dipole component? But the, dipole. the dipole is, uh, is uh, small because the, the bar is uh, bisymmetric. Uh, so it's uh, the quadrupole is cos 2 theta. The, the uh, dipole would be cos theta. So it ah, means if you go to ah, minus, okay, okay. so the opposite, if you reflect okay. with respect to the center, you, you get checked, minus density, but for you, the bar is not okay, minus. Okay, have you checked four times theta component? Yes, so I did all the expansion with all the terms. Uh, okay. So if you look at um, uh, uh, my paper 2022, it's a very stupid paper. It's just a fit to an end body bar. I plot all the multiples. Those things are important, actually. <laughs> so so the, the, you can see that the, all the odd ones are, are, are zero uh -huh. because of the, and all the even ones, the quadrupole is the strongest and the other ones are, yes, they are there, but they get uh, small very quickly. So if you just include the quadrupole and you run a simulation, or if you include all of them and you run a simulation, the result is, uh, is similar. Is it, it's, uh, okay. There are some differences, but at this level, I, did, I didn't care because I just want to understand the... Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. No other questions, so we can have the coffee break, I guess. <laughs> And essentially, what we are going to do is uh, try to look at these uh, inflows from a, a simulation point of view. So what you're using is uh, simulations we run using the moving mesh for the repo that uses a 3D Voronoi mesh, that, uh, a projection of which you can see on the right side of your screen. And uh, the full TNG physics model. Uh, the TNG physics model uh, includes a star form and a galaxy formation module that uh, implements a lot of physical processes, such as star formation and evolution, stellar and DGN feedback, uh, black hole physics, and also galactic scale outflows and uh, many more processes. But uh, a caveat that I think is important to mention is uh, the treatment of gas of the interstellar medium in these simulations. And specifically, um, by looking at the, this plot of uh, Martini et al, uh, of the phase diagram of uh, the gas in the TNG-100 simulation at redshift zero, we can see that uh, if we focus especially on the lower right part of the plot, uh, which uh, includes the gas that is found in the galaxies, the hot yellow gas and the star forming gas, uh, we can see that, uh, we can see the shape of this diagram. And if we zoom, if we want to zoom into this region, we can, we can use the phase diagram from, from one of our simulations using the TNG model. And we can see that gas uh, that exceeds the density threshold uh, is um, uh, stochastically converted to stars and it's treated with a subgrid physics model. This is not uh, very accurate as uh, compared to a phase diagram from the Silk project where um, there is uh, there are efforts to accurately treat uh, the gas. Uh, so in our simulations, this whole region of um, warm, uh, warm neutral, cold neutral, and then uh, cold molecular gas does not exist uh, in the phase diagram. And everything is, um, um, and subgrid physics is used. So this is a major caveat, but nevertheless, uh, TNG is a well-studied model and we can use it for our simulations. So uh, the first thing I would like to show you is uh, a grid of idealized simulations we run. Uh, we start with uh, a disk 
evolves in the dark matter sphere in equilibrium. The, the disk is stellar and it's massive, it's 10 to the 11, it's masses of 10 to the 11 solar masses. And uh, the halo is 10 to the 12 solar masses. And uh, we want to explore uh, the effects of the gas fraction and the evolution of the disks. Since the high resid galaxies host high gas fractions, um, we add uh, a gaseous disk in our simulation uh, so that the gas fraction becomes from 10% to 50%. Now, we run three sets of uh, our simulations. The first one is our fiducial set with uh, just the initial conditions I described. And uh, a second one where we just simply add a black hole at the center of the galaxy to take uh, advantage of the AGN feedback that is uh, included in the TNG uh, physics model. And, we, and the third one, in the third one, we also include a hot halo. Essentially, we distribute gas uh, in, the hot, uh, in the halo so that uh, it cools onto the disk and keeps the gas fraction higher than what it would be if uh, this wasn't included. Now, here I'm going to show you an overview of uh, these simulations. And uh, each row represents each one of the sets of models. And uh, each column represents a different gas fraction. And we can see that in 100 mega year into our simulations, the 50% gas fraction cases have already fragmented. So has the 40% uh, case with a hot halo, because the effective gas fraction in this case is higher due to the hot halo. And uh, uh, while spar alarms appear in the 20, 30, and the rest of the 40% uh, initial gas fraction cases. Now, moving uh, even further into the simulation, another 100 mega years, we see that the 40 and 50% gas fraction cases have fragmented, fragmented completely. But in the 30% case, uh, we see some prominent four armed and then two armed uh, spar structures. And also in the a three M spiral in the 20% case with the hot halo. As we move on, uh, these, uh, there's no major changes. Maybe the number of arms changes as uh, gas gets depleted and the galaxies evolve. And um, finally, if we, when we reach 700 mega years, we can see that the uh, simulations with the initial gas fraction of 30% and the one with 20% and the hot halo have, uh, turned, uh, have turned into barred galaxies. And uh, this stays the same as uh, until the end of the simulation, which is 100 year, year, one year, year uh, into the simulation. Now, so overall, we can see that there is an evolution in, um, uh, in the morphology of the galaxy with respect to the gas fraction. But nevertheless, since our results are preliminary we're, uh, and we want to study the radial flows, we'll focus in one simulation, specifically the one with a 20% initial gas fraction and uh, the hot halo. Now, uh, for, for our study, uh, we use a showcase snapshot of the 3M spiral. As 3M spirals are not that common in low redshift. There are some, but uh, not as many. Uh, and here we get a very nice uh, 3M spiral. And uh, we plot the star formation rate surface density because of the subgrid model we use. This will uh, show us uh, the structure of the cold gas in our simulation. And uh, as we want to study the radial flow rates, what we can do is we can plot a map of the radial uh, flow rate at its location, at its pixel. Uh, just by looking at the map, we can see that we, we have negative uh, flow rates uh, in the loci of the arms, so essentially inflows. And um, we have positive flow rates, so outflows in the internet regions. Now, if we want to quantify this a bit better, what we can do is we can use uh, the Fourier decomposition in uh, different radial annuli and get the, the phases of the MCOL3 term. And then uh, by getting a region around these, uh, these phases, we can get, uh, we can create masks to get a region around the arms, uh, close to the arms and the interarm region. If we do that and we plot the radial flow rate as a function of radius uh, for the different regimes, uh, we find that uh, plotted with blue, uh, we find the region around the arms uh, where there's a net effect of, in, there's, the net effect is inflow um, in, in the arm region from four kiloparsec and on. Um, the region, the interarm region is plotted with red where we can see that outflows dominate and the net effect is uh, inflow all along the spiral pattern. Now, of course, this is a simulation, so we can um, get, we can uh, treat 
differently the particles that have negative radial velocities, so inflows and those who have positive uh, radial velocities, and uh, plot the inflow rate and outflow rate respectively. And by doing that, we can see that uh, while the region around the arms is, very, uh, is a very small region, the majority of the inflow occurs um, in this uh, small area, while the, almost all of the outflow takes place in the interarm region. Now, if we want to further try to correlate the regions of outflows and inflows with the uh, uh, spiral arms, what we can do is we can, uh, as again, this is a simulation, we can de uh, decompose between the particles that are, have negative radial velocities and those that have positive ones and get the inflow rate and the outflow rate maps. And then if we get the star formation rate map and use uh, the phases of the uh, of the amical three component of the Fourier decomposition, um, we can get uh, we can get these phases. Of course, these phases have not real meaning uh, in this region where amical three doesn't dominate. But in the region of the arms, uh, we can see that they track very well the morphology. And now, what we can do is we can decompose uh, the radial flow rate maps and add uh, the phases of their decompositions for the amical three term on top of, on top of uh, the terms we had from the star formation rate. So essentially what we see is that the inflows are well aligned with the arms and uh, the outflows are a bit behind uh, of the arms uh, with respect to the rotation of the galaxy. Now, if we want to put this into a nicer plot, what we can do is we can get the angular offsets from for different uh, rate DL annuli. And um, that's how we get uh, the offset between these angles that you see on the left side of your screen, which we can then convert to a physical distance. So, uh, and thus see that the inflows are well aligned with the uh, loci of the arms, while the outflows take place approximately, the peak of the outflows takes place appro approximately four kiloparsec behind the uh, spiral arms. So, uh, of course, this has been shown for uh, log aspects and cases and the linear approximation, even by Roberts in 1969. But in this case, uh, we apply our methodology to try to study uh, galaxies with high gas fractions close to what is observed uh, in cosmic moon spirals. Now, uh, what we want to do also is compare our uh, simulations to observations. And in order to do that, we need to uh, increase the resolution. Uh, and uh, we would also like to have a relatively accurate cosmological context. So in order to do that, we run some um, zoom-in simulations on TNG-100 galaxies, address uh, 2 In order to get the, the sample that we will re-simulate, uh, we put the TNG-100 uh, TNG galaxies, address 2 uh, on top of two scaling relations, the main sequence relation that you can see on the left side of your screen, and the size mass uh, relation of Van der Waal that you can see on the right side of your screen. And in this case, we plot only the galaxies that fall within uh, one sigma from the main sequence and size mass relation at redshift two. Um, we want to follow up on uh, the paper of uh, Genzel et al. 2023. So we, we, get, we also put on the same plot their galaxies. There are a sample of nine uh, star forming galaxies. And um, we try to find matches that much, much as closely um, this uh, observed sample. So we select these galaxies, and out of this, I would like to show you a very nice showcase, uh, which is marked here. Now, what we do in order to uh, run a zoom-in simulation, as has already been mentioned, is uh, we get uh, the particles that uh, the galaxy consists of at the redshift uh, of the snaps we choose. We follow them uh, back in time, then we increase the resolution in the regions where they came from, and re while decreasing the resolution everywhere else, and then we rerun the simulation so that we have increased re resolution uh, in the region we're interested, in, but also a, rough, uh, a roughly accurate cosmological context. Now, uh, what we get by re-simulating this galaxy is a massive spiral of uh, three, four, roughly four times 10 to the 10 solar masses and the star formation rate of 80 solar masses per year and very gas rich, so 45% uh, gas fraction. Now, uh, before moving on the simulation, we should get some time to uh, get the feeling of what was done for the evidence of last case large-scale rapid gas inflows to be found in observations. And uh, to do that, we're going to use the example of this uh, nice redshift 2.2 spiral, okay, uh, K2087. 
So uh, the first thing we need to do in order to look for inflows in uh, such galaxies is to determine the orientation of the galaxy on on the sky. So we need to determine which edge of the galaxy is closer to us and which one is further away from us. In order to do that, we can use together uh, kinematics information, the velocity field from ionized gas, as you can see here, and uh, imaging. So um, imaging from JWST in this case, that shows us the morphology of the galaxy. Specifically, looking at the velocity field, we can see that the top part of the galaxy is approaching while the bottom part is receding. And uh, looking at the image we, uh, and knowing that the spiral arms uh, are trailing, we can see that on, in the plane of the sky, this galaxy rotates clockwise. So coupling these two information, uh, we can tell, uh, these two pieces of information, we can tell that the, uh, the right side of the galaxy is closer to us, while the left one is further away from us. Now, in order to look for new flows, uh, we have to do some more things. Specifically, we should uh, fit the rotation of the galaxy and subtract it in order to get the um, signatures of no circular motions. And in order to do that, we get a slit along the um, major axis of the galaxy, where most of the rotational information is encoded. And we fit it using uh, full forward modeling uh, in order to account for all observational effects. And now, if we subtract the axisymmetric rotation, we get the authors get the velocity field that you can see on the right. Uh, and now, knowing the orientation of the galaxy, we can see that uh, the material in this region moves uh, away from us. So it's moving towards the center of the galaxy, and that corresponds to inflow. And on the other side, uh, material is moving towards us, and this is the far side, so this corresponds to inflow again. So what we find is inflow along this parallel to this case. So uh, what we want to do is follow up on these uh, observations from the simulation perspective. And essentially, all we need to do is to orient the galaxy the same way as K2087. We add a similar inclination and uh, also a similar position angle. And then we can um, get the um, projected surface uh, uh, star formation rate surface density that we use as a proxy of what we would get if we were to observe this galaxy in H alpha. Uh, and also the resulting uh, line of sight velocity field. Of course, uh, this is a simulation, we know everything about the particles, so we can essentially decompose the velocities into the ring plane radial and tangential components, and then get the contributions of uh, these components to the line of sight velocities. Now, if we do that, we can see that while for the tangential velocities we get a relatively smooth uh, rotation pattern, uh, in the radial velocity field, we find uh, positive uh, contributions uh, along uh, the spiral on the right side of the galaxy and negative contributions along the spiral on the left side of the galaxy. So essentially, we find similar signatures to what are observed in uh, these uh, redshift 2 uh, disks. Now, another delta sign of uh, salts along the spirals uh, comes from the velocity dispersion, where we see that along the arms, the velocity dispersion is lower, but in the inner edge, uh, there is an increase in the in the velocity dispersion. Now, of course, uh, this is simply one case, one inclination, and uh, one observation. So, uh, what we can do is we can use the, we can bin the results from a simulation uh, with different different uh, pixel scales and for different inclinations, and see if uh, we can qualitatively find uh, the same residuals. And as you can see, even when the resolution becomes poor, we can. Uh, pinpoint some signatures of uh, positive diseases along the arms on the right side and negative along the arms on the left. Now, uh, if we want to quantify a bit, uh, we can compute the beta parameter that was introduced in Genzel 2023. And this parameter is essentially um, the fraction of the disk that is affected by the inflows. And uh, if we do that, we get a parameter ranging from 0 0.2 to 0, to 0 0.1, which is in agreement with what is in, in observations. And we also get uh, radial, uh, the radial the, the contribution to the Landsat velocity of the radial components. The, the maximum of this contribution is around uh, 70 kilometers per second, which is, again, uh, compatible with observations. Now, a question is, are those signatures, are those signatures, signatures of just the gas flowing in a certain way, or do they correspond to real inflows? So does our galaxy really grow? And uh, that we can assess by getting snapshots at different redshifts and uh, computing the rate of uh, growth of the baryonic mass. 
and um, getting the ratio of this uh, ratio of growth uh, of this uh, growth over the star formation rate. And what we find is that uh, on average, the um, ratio of increase of baryonic mass of the galaxy is of the order of the star formation rate. And actually, this is this seems to be true for our whole sample, but the, for the whole sample, this is still preliminary. So now. Um, Another thing I would like to show you is uh, some results from uh, the latest deep uh, observations of bars in uh, cosmic noon. So uh, in this case, uh, redshift 1.5 bar that was observed with uh, the Neumann interferometer at uh, Plateau de Bou in France. And um, so again, we can use the same framework. In this case, we use a simulation that was a 3M spiral earlier on, and we have to incline it a bit uh, in a way to, so that we get the inclination and the position angle of the disk right, and also the apparent, um, the apparent PA of the bar. And uh, if we do that, we can compare with the observations. And just to briefly go through uh, what we see here, is uh, on, the on the right, you can see some HST imaging for this galaxy, where we can see an elongated structure in the center, which uh, resembles the bar. Uh, and uh, the spiral arms. On the bottom, uh, the smooth subtracted uh, continuum from these images is shown, is overplotted as contours, and you can see the signal from um, the NIM observations from cold molecular gas, CO3 uh, to 2 transition. Now, uh, of course, there is uh, JWC data, there are JWC data available for this galaxy, and we can see that essentially this structure seems more like kind of a third arm than a whole bar, but there's still a bar in the central region of the galaxy. So we can still use uh, our simulation as an approximate match uh, for this galaxy. And um, if we get the line of velocity field for both, uh, we can see that uh, there is overall agreement, but uh, of course the simulation is, uh, we get many more details in the simulation. Uh, and that's due to the, uh, PSF uh, of our observation. Now, if we uh, follow the same uh, the methodology as described for K287 to get the line of sight velocity residuals, we get this map for this bar where we see kind of a rotating uh, a streaming pattern. And we can also do the same for uh, our simulations. And uh, specifically, we can get the contributions of the in-plane radial velocities that give us this signal. But of course, in this case, since uh, the, the bar distorts the velocity field, we can't really assume that uh, we get, we get perfectly the axisymmetric rotation by getting uh, the rotation along the major axis, right? So what we have to take into account uh, also is the perturbation to the tangential velocity. So essentially the difference between the tangential velocities, the true tangential velocities, in-plane tangential velocities and the assumed rotation from getting a slit along the major axis of the galaxy, which gives us uh, the residuals you see on your screen. And then what we expect to see is if we combine the two, we'll get the total residuals which resemble this streaming pattern that we see in the observation. Of course, uh, in the observation, we don't uh, have good enough signal to noise ratio to determine anything other than this region here. So overall, uh, we can see that we have contributions from outflows uh, of, at the, the trailing side of the bar, inflows at the leading side of the bar, and also the dust lane socks uh, at the leading side of the bar in the transition velocity. So essentially, we have many signatures that are consistent with our simulations. So that's about it. And uh, just to give you a brief recap of uh, what uh, we discussed today is uh, for our in our DLS disk simulations project, we find morphological evolution as a function of the gas fraction. And we also find inflows along the arms and outflows in the interim region. Uh, when it comes to our cosmological zoom simulations, we find uh, signatures of radial flows uh, compatible with, uh, in agreement with what that is observed. And uh, we also find that the growth rate of these galaxies uh, in the cosmic noon era is comparable to the star formation rate. And uh, when it comes to the latest NOIMA high-risk virus observations, uh, we find that, at least for SO case, uh, that the, the line of sight velocity residuals are in agreement with what we expect uh, based on our simulations. Thanks a lot. Questions?
Thank you, it was a really nice presentation. Um, in the idealized disk simulations, I wanted to ask about the feedback processes that you're including. You were talking about AGN feedback being part of your physics mm -hmm. model, um, and you have star formation, but is there supernova feedback or? Um... Yes, so the model we use is the TNG model. So it's essentially, we don't tweak it in any way. We just okay. use it as is. So yes, in the case where we add the black hole, we take in, uh, advantage of the fact that AGN feedback recipes are included in the uh, TNG model. So yeah, otherwise it's uh, all of the other types of feedback, like galactic outflows and uh, as you mentioned, the supernovae feedback and star formation, uh, sorry, stellar evolution uh, processes. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, Stavro. Hi. <laughs> Very nice talk. Okay, maybe my question is a bit naive one, but I would like to know how do you increase, okay, you want this in the idealized uh, disk simulations. You want to increase the gas fraction. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, you are putting some more gas than the, the galaxies that you have, uh, than what the galaxies have in this particular time. So how do you put it? I mean, you put it in plane or how do you do this? That's my question. Okay, uh, we we put it in a disk in um, a rotational equilibrium, so the disk has some thickness. And uh, in this particular set of simulations, what we do is we keep uh, the same disk we had. We have a fixed stellar disk of roughly 10 to 11 solar masses. And then we just uh, introduce a gaseous disk and spin up the whole thing so that it's uh, in equilibrium. But we essentially add more gas. So the whole thing becomes more massive. And that's something that we also want to address. So we are also running some simulations in which now, uh, in which we convert some of the stars in the disk to gas. So that because now, while we add uh, gas by you know intervals of 10%, which might not be very significant, uh, overall when you reach a 50% gas fraction, this adds up. And uh, we want to also run simulations where we keep uh, the mass of the disk fixed. And we can, you know, split it between stars and uh, gas. And maybe follow up of this. Don't you expect that the gas disk maybe is like more extended than the stellar one? Yes. Uh, okay. So there are some papers uh, on the topic uh, comparing uh, for high redshift the sizes of uh, essentially the the stellar continuum that would you would get from uh, JWST 444 uh, the 444 wide bath filter and uh, CO observations that find little uh, difference between uh, the effective radii of these disks. Uh, so in these galaxies, despite the fact that in low redshift, I think you have a, a more extended disk, uh, in high redshift cases, you don't. However, uh, due to numerical reasons, because if our disk is, um, uh, has the same scale length as, um, if our gas disk has the same scale length as the stellar disk, we might get some starburst in the center where the gas would be more con concentrated. We've tried both scenario with uh, a gaseous disk where the scaling of which is two times that of the stellar disk and equal scalings. So it's a very valid point. Thank you for the talk. So uh, we get uh, the, if I get it correctly, we get the radial inflow along the arms mm -hmm. and the outflow just shifted like from the arms. Yes. Uh, but maybe I missed it. So is this like uh, some sort of manifold? Is there any interpretation of this manual? Is this like some sort of manifold related thing? Or is this like radial migration? Or what, what is that? What is the reason of that? Okay. Um... I don't know. I can't really okay, answer okay. that. So, uh, yes, the, the thing is, we, we find uh, negative and positive radial velocities in the regions along uh, along the arms and in the interarm regions, as you mentioned. Now, uh, what kind of motions uh, do that? I mean, uh, we know what happens in uh, uh, low gas fraction cases where linear the linear theory, theory um, still holds, but in our case, we haven't really looked so, into. So we still need to find an interpretation for. Uh, simulations and uh, what you observe in the real disks in high Z. Mm -hmm. So we need interpretation still. Yeah, yeah, we need uh, to, yeah. yes. We find similar signatures and similar flows, but we need to see what uh, exactly happens there. Um, just a, a, also a question. 
it's a bit like in the previous talk uh, about uh, numerical viscosity. Mm -hmm. uh, in our talk, uh, can you uh, have people check the numerical vis viscosity uh, quantity in terms of uh, dissipation due to the numerical code, the energy dissipation? I, <laughs> I can't answer that. Because it could uh, be crucial. If you, have, you must have some dissipation. Which is not included explicitly in the mm -hmm. in the code by uh, radiation loss and so on, and uh, could have uh, consequences on the accretion rate and so on. I guess That's it. just a word. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Next speaker. We need a minute to. We need a minute to yes, respond to the uh, So just a minute. So we will have um, a talk by Periclus uh, Orcanalidis, radial transport of gas and stars in these galaxies in the Origa simulation. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. So my name is Periklis Ukalidis. I did my PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics. And today we'll tell you a few words about the work I did there in collaboration with uh, Robert Grant and Robert Yates, who are both now in the UK, and also with uh, Volker Springel and Gwinever Kaufman. The idea of my work was to study two processes that happen in these galaxies and are related to the secular evolution of the system, radial gas flows and stellar migration. So we wanted to study these two processes using a numerical simulation, namely the Origa simulation, and observe how these processes operate there, and if possible, arrive to a parameterized description of them that can be input into the Earth Galaxies 2020, which is a semi-analytic model that's uh, developed in Munich, among other places. Some context on these processes, so the radial gas flows you held already. Uh, I'm referring to the flows that happen within the plane of the disk, so this is xy, this is uh, xz or yz. Um, and these flows were postulated in early galaxy formation models in order to explain why we get exponential density profiles in our disks. And they were attributed to a couple of uh, physical reasons. Firstly, the fact that the gaseous disk is viscous. Also, when we have uh, gas on falling onto the disk that has different angular momentum than the gas in the disk, this can be a driver of flows. And also you shared a lot, the interactions of uh, the gas with bars and spiral alarms can drive these radial flows. And since sem these seminal works, these uh, flows have been introduced in uh, chemodynamical models of uh, galaxy evolution with several implementations. You see here one example uh, that makes use of this notion of the difference in the angular momentum of the on falling and the gas on the disk. Uh, but you can also have very simple implementations such as the one that's used currently in our galaxies, which gives the inflow velocity as a simple proportionality to the radius. And you see here the values that we get in, in the model. Uh, observationally, you heard a bit from uh, Stavros, you want to use tracers, for example, uh, uh, 21 centimeter or other molecules such as carbon monoxide uh, to look at um, the disks basically, uh, remove the rotational component and be left with what is in the radial direction. And for the local universe, we get uh, this 
range of velocities in the general regime of a few kilometers per second. Sorry. Uh, onto stellar migration. Stellar migration refers to the fact that the star is given is born at a given location within the disk at a given birth radius, but during the evolution of the system is subject to many mechanisms that can alter its position within the disk. And in the literature, there are uh, two terms that are used, uh, churning and blurring. Churning refers to changes in the guiding radius of the star, therefore the angular momentum of the orbit, and blurring uh, refers to changes in the epicycle around this uh, mean radius. Um, and driving mechanisms for stellar migration are again non axisymmetries in the disk, bars, spiral arms, but also other effects such as interactions with satellites, interaction of stellar orbit with gas clumps, or even stellar feedback has been discussed. And again, you can model this process, um, several implementations, and we have been named model the churning process with this expression for a probability for a star uh, to move from one ring to another in their model, and this is how the result looks like for all the stellar populations. And there is this model by Frank et al, which gives the probability that the star born at a given birth radius or not has migrated to a, another radius R after some given time. And this is governed by this uh, migration strength parameter. Now onto my work, uh, you heard a lot about the Origa simulation, so I will not give any more details. I will just tell you that um, I used 17 individual objects from the simulation. Nine of them were Milky Way, uh, Milky Way size and eight of them were slightly smaller mass. Uh, the resolution level was this one for the baryonic mass, 510 to the four solar masses. And we had 252 snapshots uh, spaced roughly every 60 mega years. So starting with the radial gas flows, first I will need to tell you how we track the gas in the ARIPO code because ARIPO is a moving mass use a moving mass representation for the gas. Uh, so these cells are dynamic in time. So if you want to track fluxes and flows, uh, you want to use tracer particles. These are particles that are initialized at the start of the simulation at each gas cell. And they are allowed to be uh, transferred between the phases of the cells uh, following the mass flux, the calculation of the mass flux in a probabilistic manner. These tracers can be uh, in the gas phase, in the non-star forming gas of the simulation, the gas uh, star forming gas of the simulation, one can also through star formation be locked in stars. They can be and, and they can end up in winds, and through incorporation from the winds, they can end up again in the in the gas phase. And this is also you one example how it looks like if we are now in the two D place and sell. So, uh, plane and select the tracers in the XY uh, plane uh, at the given ring. This is centered around uh, seven kiloparsec, I think, at a given snapshot. And we wanted to see how these tracers have moved around in this plane if we allow, uh, if we look at the subsequent snapshots. And you see the evolution here after one or two or three snapshots. The tracers basically follow the rotational pattern of the disk. They follow the density pattern, if you can discern here. And in general, after some time, they have diffused a lot in the XY plane. And we wanted to describe the, this effect that we see here and do that uh, consistently. So the same exercise for uh, all our galaxies at different rings. So basically select the tracers at a given ring and ask where are they at the subsequent snapshot. Um, and we can create these distributions of delta R between two snapshots. This is how it will look initially at delta function. And then after a given time, it may look, this is an example, it may look like this. And we quantify these distributions by looking at the, the median, which is an essence of the bulk motion of the material, and how wide, how spread out is this distribution, gives us how much this material has diffused, I call this parameter W. And we get these uh, two parameters for a given ring at a given uh, selection time at for a given delta T, the difference between the two snapshots. And the delta T is important because uh, here I'm doing the same exercise, but now I'm plotting the radius, I'm selecting uh, the tracers in this uh, red bin, and we look at them after one, two, and three snapshots, and we see, you see the evolution, how they have moved inwards, and they have become more and more spread out as we go to, uh, as we look longer times. And we assume there's a probably a dependence of W to delta T to some power. If it was some purely diffusive process, it would, this alpha would be a half. We find that what best fits the data is one over three. I'm not very sure about the physical reason, it's just what's there in the, in the simulation. And uh, by dividing the 
median by the dot we get a, essentially a bulk flow velocity. So here I'm showing you a compilation for these two parameters of all the data. So it's data point here is a one ring, and this is combining all our galaxies. Uh, and that's for edge if less than one. So it's a pretty much local universe. Um, so what you see here is on average in our disks, we find inflow velocities in the middle and inner parts of the disk that are fairly constant in the order of minus two, minus three kilometers per second that drop to higher values in the other parts. And this sort of diffusivity parameter increases with radius. Uh, we can stack all this data because we checked uh, what if we look at different relative ranges and what if we look at different mass ranges of our galaxies and they don't deviate very much from these averages. And we want these averages because I said our goal is to go to, to have one expression that we put into the semi-analytic model. Um, there is a lot of scatter around these curves. We wanted to see if there, is there any secondary property that uh, drives the scatter. So if we look at the residuals around this median, do they correlate with any uh, property of, of the ring that we are looking at? And the one that we pinpointed that there's potentially a correlation uh, is with the accreted gas fraction. So how much gas is accreted in this time step uh, in our ring versus the gas that's already there. Now, going on to switching to stars, to stellar migration, I will start by showing you this plot, which is very naively what you would like to see if you want to check the birth radii and the final radii. This is done for all the halos that I'm using. So final radii versus birth radii. The one-to-one -one line in these plots would imply that the star has remained in, the, in, its, in its birth position. And you see that the average, the dark lines are usually very close to this one-to-one line, but we do have a lot of scatter around it. So we do have migration of stars. Uh, for example, some stars here have been born five to 10 kiloparsec, but we moved to, to the inside. What's interesting in this plot is that some of these halos have a very strong bar. We can take, for example, this halo five or halo 28. And in these halos, we see this excess in the y-axis of stars that have moved away from the birth radius. And this is the region usually that we find the correlation of these bars and implies there is stronger migration uh, for these systems. I will come back to that later. But we wanted to look a bit further onto this plane uh, and look how it looks like maybe for different uh, stellar populations, ages of stellar populations. So what I'm showing here is, let's take one of these, it's the same, uh, selecting stars in this birth radius, that's for one halo now, and asking where, uh, where is the, what's the distribution of the final radii of these stars, basically. And the different colors are different uh, ages at the end of the simulation. So blue is the young stars and going to purple is the older stars. And we see that older populations have uh, diverged more from the birth radius that's expected because the stars had more time to interact with non axisymmetries and other mechanisms in the disk that can cause them to migrate. And uh, by looking at how wide are these distribution, we can get a sigma parameter for the width. We can do that for many rings and for oral halos, get some averages and create this plot, which is now this migration strength versus stellar age. That looks like this. So younger and the different colors here are uh, rings going from inside to outside, the selection of them. Um, you see younger stellar populations have on average maybe two times less uh, stellar migration through their lifetime. And this is overplotted here is the model that I showed you before from Frank and Lital, what it predicts. So there's quite good agreement, albeit we find a slightly uh, slower slope in the age evolution. Another result I wanted to show you is on the metallicity profiles. Again, I'm showing here on the top is a halo that has a strong bar, on the bottom a halo that doesn't develop a bar at any point of its evolution. The solid lines are the metallicity profiles that we get at redshift zero. Color coded again, uh, decomposed, if you will, in uh, the ones for the older stars in green and the ones for the younger in blue and cyan in between. And what's interesting here are the dust lines, which are the profiles that would have resulted if there was no stellar migration. So if we basically took the birth radii of the stars as their final radii. And these profiles in the case of the bar that doesn't have a strong, of the galaxy doesn't have a strong bar, they look pretty much identical. When we do have a strong bar, in most cases, we find this effect of flattening of the of metallistic gradient, uh, which is more pronounced for the older stellar populations. And wanted to see, okay, if we fit this outer slope 
um, and calculate the change, does it correlate with the bar strength? Um, there is a correlation, I wouldn't argue it's too strong, but in general, when we have stronger uh, A2 coefficients or stronger bars, if we observe a uh, larger delta alpha, the change on the slope, so flattening of the profiles. Now, so far I was talking about burst radii and final radii. We wanted to see also more instantaneous or shorter time changes because of this migration. Uh, so here is, I'm showing changes in the guiding radii between two times. And here in the uh, x-axis is initial uh, guiding radius in the time of selection. And here is the change of the guiding radius basically. On top again is a, a barred galaxy and the bottom a non-barred galaxy. Uh, and going from uh, left to right, I'm increasing the time that I'm looking at from 200 mega years to 1.4 giga years. And you see a striking difference when we have a bar and we, what, when we do not. Uh, that's usually found in such uh, plots. Um, when we have a bar, we see these reeds of stars that have migra migrated. These have migrated uh, inwards, these have migrated outwards. And these reeds correspond to the again, to the correlation of the bar that drives much stronger migration. Uh, but what's interesting also is that this pattern kind of widens if we look at larger uh, times. So we want to see, can we potentially parameterize the x-axis, how wide is this pattern with radius and with time? And we get these sort of curves. For, this is the, how wide is the pattern again uh, for different uh, separation between the synapses that I'm looking at. This again, averaging, compiling over data. And you see there is a clear uh, evolution that we can parameterize and display. Uh, here I'm also decomposing this curve, selecting one time step that I'm looking after between the sample that has a strong bar and then that's the weak bar, so splitting my sample in, in two. And you see the effect that it's pretty much obvious here that in the barred galaxies we have uh, higher values uh, of the pattern, especially in the middle parts of the disk. And this is like by parameterizing these planes, we get these equations uh, that, that are in, uh, as a function of radii and delta t uh, that describe the spreading of the gas, how much we sift the gas and the spreading of the stars, basically modeling stellar migration. And we can take these equations and go to uh, galaxies now. Uh, we didn't hear about uh, semi-analytics, so I'll tell you a few things. So at uh, galaxies uh, as a semi-analytic model, what does it do? it builds galaxies on top of uh, dark matter merger trees that come from a dark matter only parent simulation. And how these galaxies are modeled are usually uh, imagined as a set of reservoirs that hold mass. Usually you use a hot gas, a cold gas, and a stellar reservoir. And in the model, you use physically motivated recipes to basically dictate how mass is exchanged between the different reservoirs. For example, star formation a recipe, which in many cases is very similar to the ones they use in simulation, will turn uh, cold gas to stars, feedback mechanism will heat the gas maybe or eject it overall from the galaxy. But we also uh, model chemical evolution, we model mergers. Um, what the galaxies has on top is a radial ring decomposition of the gaseous and stellar reservoir, so a realization of a disk essentially. Um, so on top of the total mass, we have like X mass in, uh, in the gas for, uh, for a galaxy. We know how much mass we have at uh, different radii, and that allows us to, in the end of the model, to output radial properties. So in this scheme, we wanted to implement, uh, update the existing gas inflow recipe and implement a stellar migration. So essentially tell the gas and the stars how to uh, move around these rings at every time step, at every iteration of the model. Uh, I won't go into too much details here because it's still, this is uh, ongo ongoing work. I will show you the idea behind it. So we want an algorithm that basically does what we got from Origa. Here you see some toy model to, to show you the, the effect. So if I put all my mass at one ring, run the algorithm for some time, we see how gas in this case is transported inwards and spread out and how mass is uh, built to, to the inside. And again, toy representation of a mock surface density profile, there's a red line down here. After some time going from blue to yellow and the yellow curve at the end, we have uh, amassed uh, all the gas in the very center and depleted these rings. And this is just me pushing gas inside. There's no star formation or um, 
other physical effects. And eventually what we want to do is uh, to get uh, density profiles for gas and stellar mass, uh, uh, for gas and stars, yes, and compare them with observations. These are data points here. You can focus maybe on the 10 to 10, 10 to the 11 solar masses population of the model. And, but these are very, very, don't take it uh, like for, take it with a grain of salt because this, uh, we did a change to the model. And when you change the model that has so many parameters, you need to do a recalibration because you put something new, maybe you need to tweak something else to get, uh, to calibrate with uh, mass functions and, and the stuff that you need. Uh, the same here for the stars. And uh, I will leave you here with, uh, with the conclusions, with a summary. Thank you. Questions? Thank you for the talk. So, uh, is it correct? <coughs> Sorry. Uh, that so we take in your simulations, we take like uh, one sun uh, mass star, and we can like assume from these results which uh, the radio uh, position of it will be like during the like I don't know one rotation of the galaxy disk or something like that. Uh, Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, what was the question? Like, if, if it's one solar mass or? Yeah, okay, we, we take like some star. Can we yeah, assume yeah. like, uh, can we get the estimation of the, how it change its radius with like several rotations of the disk? We have like the exact number, like um, 500 per six. I mean, you can do it for individual, like you can look at specific stellar particle, you can have each orbit and stuff, but what we wanted was more of a, like a statistical description of what the, the yeah, population have, of stars. Yeah, but you have like several uh, estimations for the flow uh, rate, I assume. So you can probably estimate. Uh, oh yeah, like in the model, that's what you want to model, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, we, uh, the idea was to take the information from the simulation and. Repro um, reproduce it in the model, like. Yeah, because we are interested in, in real galaxies, actually, how the first place and the final place can be different from each other. And this is actually an interesting question. How can we apply this to the derivations? Yeah, thank you. In, in the, the toy model, you, you have uh, diffusion in, in the rings. Are there Gaussian diffusion? Is it what Gaussian? Because, yeah. Because in the ring geometry, you have a correction to add, add because it's a, you cannot um, diffuse beyond the center. Oh, yes, yes. There are many like uh, details on how this algorithm is implemented into all galaxies. Like in the end, of course, you want, you know, there is a limit and it's zero. You cannot go further. You need to account for that and account for like the mass. Uh, the proper diffusion function, they are different. The Bessel functions and so on. See the paper by Brunetti in 2013. No, like, uh, yeah, uh, uh, this algorithm, I'm just using uh, pure Gaussians, just for simplicity, because you want. Um... Yeah, yeah, but even if it's, it's just because of the geometry, mm. it's not a Gaussian. Uh, nice work. Um, so maybe I missed it, but w the the flattening of the metallicity profile does it happen uh, immediately after the bar or? or uh, I didn't. I, I didn't look at that. I. I mean, like uh, when it starts to flatten. When not, ah, okay, not when it, when the bar forms. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, I can ask her, I cannot ask her that for sure, yeah. but like, yeah. Yeah, it looks like it starts like around 0.6, 0 0.7, R90, right? So then you have to see how long is the bar, but okay. I get, I get yeah, it idea. depends like the and different just, bar. Just another quick one. Did you check at the, did you check the metallicity in the bar? Because in, in timer we've been finding that the, 
the stellar metallicity in the bar is higher or at least the same as the metallicity in the surrounding this? Uh, no, no, we do not check anymore like on the metallicities. It could be interesting to check if you find the same. And like uh, I should say, like for these stars, most of them were selected to be like in uh, disk stars. So we uh, okay. had a circularity cut okay. at some point. Okay, thank you. No other questions? Yes. Uh, first, I agree with uh, Dimitri's point. Maybe it would be nice to check when this uh, begins in dark galaxies. But did you also check if you have this flattening happening without existence of a uh, without without um, um, formation of a bar? Did, did, did you check your new simulations where bar don't form? That if you also have this flattening uh, without that. So. Uh... Or to rephrase that, like how significant it is if, if in presence and in absence of a bar. Um, yeah, so that's basically like why we looked at halos that do ha have a bar and those that do not, and we saw this this difference. Uh, we didn't like run controlled simulations, maybe to check if when we put a bar, how strong, etc. This is just the, the results from the, the halos that I used. Um, but yeah, the, the general idea from this metallistic profile was that in those halos that did have a bar, we know they had a bar, and um, in the time scale that we were looking, they had formed a bar already long ago. Uh, in the end, we saw this fl this flattening of a metallistic gradient. Thank you. Let's speaker. Nice. So you have now um, Mero. You will speak. It's, uh, yeah. it's not exactly like in the program. So it was the talk of uh, yesterday. So the title is Did, did GES form the Milky Way Star? Yes. The title is a bit different. Okay. Yes, just check it's working. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hi, um, I'm Alex Marrow. I'm doing my PhD at Liverpool Donmore University. And I'm going to talk about my project um, on galaxy interactions and that's fallen. <laughs> My PC is so terrible. It's not really stable for that. Okay, this is working a bit better then. <laughs> So, I'm Alex Merrow, um, do my PhD at Liverpool John Moores University, and I'm going to be talking a bit about my project um, on galaxy interactions and how they impact stellar bars. So, this talk split into two parts. The first is the main part um, about the potential formation mechanism for the Milky Way's bar, with the second part going into a bit about the evolution of pattern speed with interactions on a pre-existing bar. So obviously this has been covered a bit this week, but I'll just go over it. So bars can form in isolation due to the self-gravity of massive disks, um, but they can also be triggered by external tidal forces. Now, mergers can have both effects, so exerting tidal forces on their way in, while also changing conditions in the galaxy with their impact, meaning that this allows for them to have a varied effect on bars. 
um, from creating them, strengthening, weakening them, or in very rare cases, um, destroying them in simulations. Um, the Milky Way's uh, last significant merger um, happened around um, 10 gig years ago, uh, known as the GES, which again, we've heard a bit of this week, um, at stellar ratio of around um, 5 to 20 percent. Um, at a similar, at a potentially similar time, the Milky Way's bar formed, which has persisted to present day. Um, there, this definitely isn't a clear-cut timing, but evidence seems to be go, going to hear, but um, we've had this week um, indications of a potentially younger bar. But the um, scenario we're investigating is this older bar. So is there a link between these two significant events happening so close together? So we do so using the Ariga cosmological simulations. Um, and in particular, we have looked at Ariga 18. Uh, this is because uh, Francesca um, investigated and found that it has quite similar chemokinematics and bulge at present day. Um, it also has a GES-like merger at a similar mass ratio about nine giga years ago, which um, leaves a similar signature in the chemokinematics at redshift zero. Um, it's also helpful this um, halo exists with 3,000 snapshots. So that's a time resolution of around five mega years, which is great for trying to order and work out causation for events. Riga 18 also has a bar. Um, so having a quick look at uh, the evolution. So this is just before the GS-like merger enters. So that's about to happen now. It causes some significant disruption, but very quickly around the eight gig year mark, we do form a bar. Um, this bar does last till the end of the simulation. So here we have the bar strength from the top panel um, with the distance of the GS like merger in the bottom panel. And you can see that the bar strength quickly rises when the GES has its pericenter and merges and maintains itself towards the end of the, form of the simulation. Um, one so looking at the first possible culprit, um, the tidal forces from the GES merger. Um, here we have the evolution of the um, second Fourier mode, which is one which tends to indicate a bar with, with time at different radii. Um, uh, there's the pointer. Um, so on the first pericenter, there's a perturbation in the sort of mid-disc, which makes its way inwards um, to the central regions. Uh, this dissipates, and then we have another similar perturbation making its way inwards. This happens a couple of times until we form a um, long-lived bar indicated by this in a few kiloparsecs consistent um, heightened A2 profile. For comparison, uh, Wokas in 2018, we looked at, and they set up two identical galaxies to inter interact predominantly tidally. And we see a very similar pattern of repeated outside in perturbations. So here and then solve and coming in here again to form a bar. So this might indicate that the formation mechanism is tidal due to the similarity. Um, one of the other things that G this GS analog does on its first pericenter is it moves the bulk of the gas inwards. So here we have the radial distribution of the mass around the time of the event. Um, this creates a more central gas profile, um, which if we look at the radial distribution for the stars as well, um, so it, um, creates a sustained starburst in the inner five kiloparsecs or so. Um, this increases the amount of baryons in the bar forming region, which can also contribute to a higher likelihood of forming a bar. Um, bars themselves though can also move gas inwards. So it's useful to try and disentangle um, the effects going on by removing the GS-like merger. 
So we go to the merger tree from the simulation um, and identify every dark matter particle that's associated with the object at its peak mass. We go back a bit further um, to Redshift 4 when most of these particles are far away from the main halo and remove these and then use this as initial conditions for rerunning the simulation from this point. So on the left, we have the original and on the right, the new rerun with the merger removed um, just after the initial conditions where they are more or less the same. And here is just before the merger event, you can see that we have two more or less identical central galaxies with the obvious difference of the GES and its counterpart in this simulation about to enter. So here we're comparing the bar strengths and with the original in, with the original in black and the rerun in the magenta. And you can see that it does form a bar, but there's a delay of around two gig years in the new simulation. Um, it's worth noting that we do have a later smaller merger, that small counterpart you could see all still coming in around eight gig years. But this, um, does, co and this does cause some disruption in the bar-like mode, but this is fairly short-lived and dissipates before the actual bar formation event, suggesting that um, the GS was required to form this bar rather than just any merger. Um, so we've already discussed that the GS-like merger um, caused an increase in baryon do dominance in the inner regions, which I represent here by the rotation curve as if it were only stars um, divided by the full rotation curve within the inner eight kiloparsecs. Um, how, and so at the time of the original bar formation, the original does have a higher inner baryon dominance. However, by the time we actually form the bar at, a, at the red line in the rerun, it has a much higher baryon dominance than um, the original required, suggesting that this level of um, in, in, in a baryons wouldn't have been enough um, on its own to form the bar in the original. Um, we also, moving on from bar, look at some of the late time differences. And as is obvious here, the original has a much more extended disk than the rerun. Uh, this is reflected in the angular momentum of the gas. So we've got specific angular momentum here for different regions of the gas. And they diverge around seven giga years ago um, with the original's angular momentum rising and the reruns seeming to fall. fall. Now, this can't be explained simply by the, in, the angular momentum imparted by GS directly. Um, this comes in at an angle and actually it reorients the disk. The effect this actually has is to align it with the surroundings. So this is the angle between the stellar disk and the angular momentum of the gas within 50 kiloparsecs and everything associated with the halo, which is about twice as far. Um, in the original, there's a, um, everything gets misaligned when the GES analog arrives, but things settle down and um, future gas is accreted in the plane of the galaxy to build up its angular momentum. In the rerun, however, everything um, starts to get out of plane with each other, and this stops the new gas accretion being able to contribute to the angular momentum of the pre-existing disk. Um, Back to the bar, um, we, all, we also have a look at the Teneriga halos, which um, Fatahi um, identified as having GS-like mergers from their present day kinematics. Um, so here we have their merger times plotted against their bar formation times. And so um, it seems like the line of equal times as I've missed off here, but um, these five form their bars around the same time as the GES merger, indicative of the, um, the correlation. Um, these, these five galaxies, as well as one which doesn't form a bar at all, are the five heavier GES-like mergers. 
um, and the true GS is more on the lower mass end. And these five higher mass ones don't actually form their bar until significantly after the merger, suggesting that some of the specific properties of GS, including its relatively low mass, may be key to forming a bar this early. So I've got some conclu conclusions up there for part one of the talk, um, essentially culminating in the suggestion that the GES merger very plausibly could have triggered the formation of the Milky Way's bar in reality. Um, on to the second part of the talk. Um, again, we've looked at pattern speeds a bit. We'll give a quick overview. Um, we see a variety of pattern speeds um, of bars in the universe, but they do tend towards the fast. Um, simulations show that over their evolution, they tend to slow due to the spherical components, um, giving them the angular momentum in the galaxy. Um, and they also um, slightly less consistently tend to grow as they capture more stars into bar supporting orbits. Um, galaxy interactions uh, much um, can have, again, both effects by imparting a torque on the bar um, and changing initial condition, internal conditions, which has the potential for speeding up or slowing down bars. So we use a few more of the um, Arig simulations for this study. Um, to measure the pattern speed directly, we need the good temporal resolution again, and 10 of the halos do have this. Um, we also um, run seven extra at the higher time resolution, which have mergers at recent times. Um, this includes some of these slightly lower mass um, Milky Way analogs. Um, for this, I use the curly R parameter. I know there was a bit of a discussion on what to call this um, the other day, so I'm just going to stick with curly R. Um, and as a reminder, this is the co-rotation radius over the bar length. And we define a slow bar as having curly R greater than 1.4, um, fast being between 1 and 1.4, and ultra fast um, being less than 1. Um, so just, just as an example, this is a Riga 17, which has a long time of evolution without any significant external interactions. And it starts off as an ultra fast bar and very gradually slows down to become a regular fast bar. So to look at an example of interaction, we have um, a Riga 24. So in the top panel here is the pattern speed. Um, and um, in the second panel is, is the co-rotation radius in blue and the bar length in red. For the third panel, we have the uh, ratio, the curly R parameter. And on the bottom, we have the Elm Green parameter for various interactions that happen over a lifetime. The Elm Green parameter is a measure of the impulse in, of the torque imparted on to the center of the galaxy. Um, relative to um, that galaxy's dynamics. Um, so in particular, um, we're interested in this here, which represents a satellite which uh, merges around this point. And at the same time, the pattern speed has a sharp but small decrease, leading to a small increase in the co-rotation radius. However, at the same time, the um, bar the bar length increases slightly, and this actually ends up with no change to the curly R parameter. Um, not all of the interactions are like this. Um, some just cause a fair amount of chaos. Um, looking at some of the overall results, um, we actually see that um, galaxies with interactions in the last six big years or so tend to have a higher curly R parameter representing their bars being slower. Um, so here we've got the most significant interactions Elm Green parameter plotted against that, that parameter averaged over the last um, 200 mega years. And we see this relatively clear trend, um, including no fast bars with recent mergers greater than um, 0 0.01 in their Elm Green parameter. Um, um, I think it's been mentioned that um, 
bars that form from interactions may be slower, but many, many of these interactions happen after the bar is formed. The correlation, however, may be indirect um, since this, act this trend actually includes um, the speed of the bar before the interactions. So it requires some further investigation, although it doesn't seem to be completely captured by the time of the bar formation or the mass that the bar forms at. Um, so thank you. And if there's any questions for either part, I'll let you let you watch some videos while they happen. Questions? Hi, Alex. Thank you. Very nice talk. Um, I was curious because in the first part, you have the same simulation with and without the GS like merger, right? So I was wondering about the pattern speed of these two situations. If, because I noticed that you, you reach the same strength in the bars in these two situations, but I was wondering how the pattern speed could compare if you looked into that. Um, yes, yeah, so here we have the curly R parameter for both of them. Um, it's worth noting there's a bit of chaos in the rerun in the last couple of giga years. This is because of, it runs out of gas in the polar disk forms. Um, but in any case, um, the, during the time when it is easy to get a pattern speed, the um, new bar is both shorter um, but it also rotates faster, and this results in it being ultra fast rather than the original simulation's um, regular fast pattern speed. Um, I have a question about uh, how to define the length of the bar, because I think in the literature you have uh, many ways to define this length. So, of course, uh, the dispersion on the, <laughs> on the results. Uh, how do you define this little bar length? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I have looked at a couple of options. I've so far been settling on the um, first radius at which the bar-like second Fourier mode um, dips below 60% of its maximum. Mm -hmm. um, this is generally relatively reliable, but um, like many versions of automatic uh, bar length methods, can lead to a fair amount of errors, particularly when spiral arms align, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because you had some R below one right, at the beginning. It's typically because in the definition you include the spiral arms, so it looks longer, so longer than the corrotation. Yes, yes, because ultra bars typically um, aren't theoretically possible, but when you're measuring a bar length, it's quite imperfect. Um, and that seems to be the case of my measurements of bar lengths as well. Mm -hmm. I, uh, thanks a lot for a nice talk. Uh, I was curious because we know uh, GAC, uh, we can find it in uh, clearly in, in, in the angular momentum space uh, if we plot current uh, uh, stars or, or globular clusters as we see yesterday. Does it match in your simulations the properties that we see in the radial merger? Is it the same for the simulated uh, galaxy pair? Uh, yes, as far as I know. Um, the work done by Fatahi, which um, was how I got the 10 galaxies of a GS-like merger, as far as I'm aware, was based on these kind of measures at Redshift Zero to identify a merger as being GS-like. What's GS? GSC. <laughs> You see? Yeah, the gyro sausage slash Enceladus merger event. Oh, yeah. Um, so, Fatahi um, 2019 paper was using these kind of measures from the galaxies at redshift zero to identify the GS like mergers. No further questions. So, thank you. Your next speaker. Yes. Yeah. 
So, the court, she, she may speak about the GWS, GWST investigation and to the bar faction of Kayachi. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tifanos, for having me. You've accommodated me here, and I'm very grateful for that. And we've heard a lot about the theory and simulations already this morning. So let's move on to some observations to finish off. Uh, my name's Zoe. I'm a PhD student at Durham University. I'm supervised by Dimitri Godotti. And we're going to talk about bar fractions at high redshifts. So bars are key indicators that a system is evolved and mature. And it's believed that in the early universe, galaxies go through these violent merging phases and then followed by a cooling and settling phase in which these instabilities cause these central structures to form. Um, in observations, it's still unknown as to whether bars evolve and that can be in length or whether or not they can be destroyed. However, it is very important that they are the key um, drivers of internal secular um, galaxy evolution. And that's because they redistribute the angular momentum within the system, provoking that gas inflow, igniting star formation, um, and forming the central nuclear disk and bulges, and potentially fueling the AGN as well. In the local universe, there have been several um, studies looking at the local bar fraction, and bars seem to be one of the most abundant non-axisymmetric structures in disk galaxies. When including weak, weaker bars, this bar fraction is all the way up to 80%. Bars are made of older stellar populations, and therefore they're traced in the near infrared, and they're also less um, affected by the dust extinction at these longer wavelengths. Um, Marinova and Yogi 2007 show that in their H band, they see a higher bar fraction than what they find in the B band in the local universe. In this literature, there's many different methods for which you can identify bars. This can either be done visually or using more automated processes. And I'll go into a few of these later on in the talk. And we have had a few studies look at the evolution of the bar fraction with HST. So these studies are limited up to about redshift one, and they all find a steady in decrease in the bar fraction up to redshift one. And Simmons 2014 pushed this boundary up to redshift 1.8. They didn't find much of an evolution and it remained at about 10%. In more recent years, we've had lots of developments with the simulations, and we've already heard from Francesca on Tuesday about the Auriga simulations, and here this is just comparing those HST observations in grey crosses to the Auriga bar fraction, and it agrees very well in that it's decreasing up to about redshift 3.5. On the right-hand side, I show Rosas Guevara, 2022, this is quite a complicated plot at first glance, but if you focus on the black solid line at first, this is using the TNG 50 uh, galaxies. And they find actually a deep increase in the bar fraction up to about redshift two. And even at high redshifts or about redshift four, they're still finding a bar fraction of 30%. So much higher than what we found in observations. They have applied mass cuts, which you can see in pink and green. And then also they applied a bar length limit. So if you now look at the blue solid line, this is when bars have to be greater than two kiloparsecs. This agrees much better with the observations and we'll discuss this in my recent work. So now we've had the first light of JWST and there have been several um, high redshift bars already found. This is extremely exciting work and I just show a handful of them here, either using JWST or ALMA data. And these claims that there are high redshift bars already questions our understanding of that bars would form after about redshift one. Instead, the highest redshift here is all the way up to seven. 
And finally, there have been several studies since JWST has come out looking at the um, fraction of morphologies up to high redshifts. So firstly, Ferreira 2023 looks at just three different types of galaxies, spheroids, disks, and peculiars, and finds that already one billion years after the Big Bang, the Hubble sequence is already in place. With disk, um, disk galaxies dominating after about redshift five. There has also been a series of epochs papers come out over the past year. And I have picked out Omarod et al 2024 because they show this very interesting plot that even at high redshifts, the Cersic index of massive high redshift galaxies is very low. But the key thing is, is that you can still differentiate between the spheroids and disks. And so then this motivates our work for that we can find a disk sample at high redshifts, and then we can find what the bar fraction would be at these high redshifts. So the question for my paper that came out earlier this year was when do bars form? We look for them between redshifts one, two, three, and really we want to see if any occur beyond redshift two. We also take a look at the bar fractions dependence on wavelengths, um, observed at and the stellar mass. And then the key thing is we want to see if there's a difference between the HST observations and the JWST observations. So as for our sample, we use the first four Sears pointings and we're using the two longest wavelength filters from NIRCAM. This is the 4.44 microns filter and 3.56. This has given us a resolution of about two kiloparsecs. As for our HST data, we're looking at galaxies in the candles EGS and UDS fields, and we're using the 1.6 microns filter, so already much bluer. Overall, we have over 5,000 galaxies between redshifts one and three, and to emphasize is we want to make a direct comparison between uh, JWST bar fractions and HST bar fractions. We have all the same galaxies at these early stages in both samples. So galaxies are randomly orientated in our universe, and so we want to remove those that are highly inclined and we don't introduce a bias. This is because those that are seen edge on at these high redshifts, a boxy peanut shape wouldn't be clear with the resolutions we have. And so we first will fit elliptical isophotes to our galaxies, then fitting um, them with a fixed center. And finally, we take those outer isophotes and if their ellipticity is greater than a 60 degree inclination, they're removed from our sample. Now the bar fraction is the number of bars in the number of disks. So what we want to do is now use the published bar uh, disk fractions from both the JWST Ferreira et al 2023 and Cartel Tepe et al 2015 for JWST and HST. The difference in these is in JWST, there were six um, independent classifiers and their disk fraction was about 45%. Whereas in HST, there was only three participants uh, visually classifying these candles galaxies and their disk fraction was about 76%. I show an example here of a uh, six galaxies in both the JWST and HST filters ones that are disk on, disky on the top row and non-disks on the bottom row. And the key thing here is in this JWST filter, the central galaxy, you can see this hexagonal shape. This is from the PSF effects of JWST. Um, and so these galaxies with bright uh, centers are actually unresolved. So a brief note on the different methods uh, for how we can identify our barred galaxies. So it's very favorable to use more quantized methods as it's reproducible. And one of those is to use ellipse fits. The limitation of these ellipse fits is that if you have a more inclined galaxy, one that's not quite so clear and face on, or has some clumpy star forming regions, which we see um, more at these higher redshifts, then the elliptical isophotes won't trace the bar nearly as well. 
if we do have a very well-behaved galaxy that's face-on, then this is one that we have found in our sample. And this is how we would measure that it's a bar. You'd first look for an increase in the ellipticity and a constant position angle along the bar. And then you'd want to see a change in greater than 10 degrees when you reach the outer disk and also a drop in the ellipticity. As we don't have a whole sample of perfectly face-on galaxies, we then want to do visual classifications instead. So we had five classifiers who could vote uh, yes, maybe, or no to a bar being present in both the HST and JWST images. And we defined a strongly barred galaxy as one which received three yeses and a weakly barred galaxy as one that received three maybes. I show you this vote account histogram just to emphasize the difficulties in identifying high redshift barred galaxies. So on the positive axis, this is for JWST and negative is for HST. And we already have over 120 galaxies in which um, a, at least one of our participants thought that there was a bar present. A quick note on the mass of uh, the stellar mass of our sample. We adopt the Duncan et al. 2019 95% empirical completeness. And this is the green step function here. The sample in total was over 85% complete. And once we do adopt this, we then look for our barred galaxies, which are in pink here. And you can see that they do reside in slightly higher um, stellar mass galaxies at higher redshifts, but there isn't a clear trend here. And that will be for a future study. This is just to emphasize how the improved sensitivity and longer wavelengths of JWST have really enabled us to do this study. This is uh, the same galaxy in HST on the left, and you can sort of see a spiral arm but you definitely wouldn't be able to measure a bar length or identify this as a clearly barred galaxy. Whereas in our JWST filters, this is very clearly a bar. Um, you still have this bright central region, but in the central image, this is in the slightly bluer filter and therefore slightly improved uh, resolution than in our right filter. So these are the strongly barred galaxies, which we found in our sample. You can see that many of them have beautiful spiral arms, almost grand designs. Some of them are quite highly inclined. So I'd say this one here and potentially this one. This, these ones maybe wouldn't have been seen in our ellipse fit method. And I also add in a five kiloparsec scale on each image. And this just emphasizes how long these bars have to be at high redshifts in order for us to see them. So we are definitely missing bars below three kiloparsecs because of those resolutions. As for our final results for this paper, this is our evolution of the bar fraction. Firstly, we include all of those HST um, bar fraction results in gray, and we include Simmons who went up to redshift 1.8 in the left facing triangles. As for our HST bar fraction, you can see this here in pink. This agrees very well with Simmons. As for our JWST bar fraction, which is in blue, this is twice the bar fraction found in HST. It agrees well with the Auriga bar fractions. And we find now 39 barred galaxies in JWST and only 10 in HST. The main conclusions of this is that we are seeing already these mature evolved systems at high redshifts, and that it's commencing much earlier than what we previously thought. Since our paper came out earlier this year, there have been two other studies that have also looked at the bar fraction using JWST. We first have Liang who looks at the um, effects of the filters in JWST on the bar fraction. So they theorize that if you um, use the two microns filter, which is the bluest, then you would find a much higher bar fraction of about 40% even at redshift three, which is extremely high. Our results agree very well. However, they don't take into consideration that the bar fraction is greater at longer wavelengths. 
As for um, the left-hand side, this is the recent paper that came out last week from Gyur et al. 2024, who also looked at the bar fraction at the same redshift um, ranges and looked at both the visual and ellipse fit um, bar fractions. These are the black and orange diamonds here, and ours are in the blue. They're within area of each other. Their bar fractions are slightly smaller. However, they do use a different sample. So they're now using the 10 Sears pointings. And they also use a different mass limit of those greater than 10 to the 10 solar masses. The key thing is, is, though, is that both agree that there are um, bars at high redshifts and that we are getting more of these evolved um, systems at high redshifts of about redshift three. So moving on to just some of the other properties which we can look at at these high redshifts. The interesting one is the bar length. So there are different studies that find that um, the bar length should evolve with time. And this is in particular because we see smaller disks at higher redshifts. There are other studies that um, believe that the bar length should remain constant. And we already heard from Francesca this week that at high redshifts, this might be because the bar is already saturated. You also looked at this and these are the projected bar lengths. They're not the true bar lengths of uh, these galaxies. However, uh, the, the result that I like to take away is that in the um, bluest filter, the two F200 filter, uh, the bars are shorter than in the F400 filter. And the way in which the literature has previously measured bar length also once again varies drastically. So we can either do this visually, we could use the ellipse fits method, which I'll go into in a minute, or we can also do Fourier analysis, which is typically done at lower redshifts. So these are now moving on to um, my preliminary results of the study we're doing at the moment. We are now using the 10 Sears pointings uh, to find the bar fraction, but in particular, we want to answer the question, does the bar evolve over the redshift range of one to four? So now this is applying the same Duncan et al. 2019, 95% empirical completeness limit to the sample. And it's a much larger sample, as you can see. We then also decide to use um, source extractor to remove any of those surrounding um, features in our images. So this is actually quite a clear isolated galaxy compared to some of them. Um, but then we can fit the elliptical isotopes much more clearly now. We then have also used uh, Infit, which fits, a, um, which fits exponential profiles to the galaxies. And this is because we want to look at the distribution in the CERSIC index of our sample. And you can see here that at uh, these high redshifts, we still have, on average, a very low CERSIC index. And finally, when we go to look at the bar length, so this is very preliminary at the moment, um, one of the methods which we can use is ellipse fits. If we want to do this, this is very similar to if we want to classify a galaxy as a barred galaxy. So we're looking for a peak in ellipticity, then the following minima in ellipticity, and a change in the position angle. All these three parameters can be uh, used to define the end of the bar in all different studies. So some just select one of these parameters, or some select um, taking the average of these parameters. Erwin 2005 found that the change in position angle overestimates the length of the bar. And this can be seen here on this left-hand um, example. And these two galaxies are in our new sample where they're at redshifts 1.3 and 1.5 respectively. And their bar lengths using the average of these three parameters is around 4.6 kiloparsecs and 3.7 kiloparsecs. So once again, fairly long bars. So as some final thoughts as I'm going into my next study, I'm looking at um, if we can consider any resolution um, effects in our errors of these bar fractions. 
And can we assume that these disks are vertically thin at high redshifts and therefore um, I can deproject them using their inclination? And then I want to look at if the bar evolves over the redshift range one to four. And then finally look at um, the environments in which these galaxies are in and to see if they've got companions and that's why the bars formed. As for our conclusions, from the paper, we found that the bar fraction was 18% between redshifts one to two, and this decreased to 12%. The, the JWST bar fraction is twice that of HST, and that we are definitely missing these shorter bars. And so we claim that um, this is still a lower limit on the true bar fraction. But finally, on the positive note, is that we have definitely seen that internal secular evolutionary processes are already in place much earlier than what we previously thought. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Hobie, for a very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering about how the five participants that took into the classification of the bars were selected. Are all experts in astronomy, or did you try to select someone non-astronomy related? How did you select it? Yeah, it was all um, people within our collaboration. So people that have only been looking at bars in their research. Yeah, so very experienced with this. But there is Galaxy Zoo that used the public to mm -hmm. do this. and. Um, we're going to, they'll be releasing their bar fractions very soon. So it'll be interesting to see how ours vary from there. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, if I guess it correctly, these fractions are apparent fractions. So you take in images and calculate the number of bars on them. Yeah. Uh, they're all individual snapshots of every galaxy. Yeah. Yeah. So, but uh, you can. And you have this like directional biases, so maybe the real fraction is bigger than because there are less massive galaxies, less bright ones, and yeah. But, uh, actually, Dmitry yesterday mean, uh, mentioned the paper where they do the same for the spiral fractions, and they do this some sort of test like artificially redshifted images, mm -hmm. and you can try to estimate the real. Uh, what the real fraction is, you just do the same test, but yeah. for the redshifted uh, images. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. So we haven't looked at anything like that. It's slightly similar to what Liang's paper was uh, this year, where they were trying to look at if we just apply a resolution limit to all these simulated galaxies, how does the bar fraction yeah, also because vary? I think so, the, yeah. The real fraction is even bigger than the twenty percent. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, a very nice talk. Uh, probably a question which is connected with this one. How do you, maybe you mentioned it, uh, how you do, do you estimate the errors on the fraction? Yeah, so I missed that out. Um, we include both the systematic and statistical errors on uh, the bar fractions. So we calculate the statistical from um, the beta distribution, um, which is the Jeff Jeffrey's interval, 68% uh, interval. And we use that over the normal approximation because of this is a smaller sample than what a normal approximation would benefit from. And then we include the disk fraction um, errors from both Carta Tepe and um, and Ferreira in their disruption errors that they found. Um, yeah. Thanks for a very nice talk and very nice uh, graphics as well. <laughs> Slides are very good. Just a comment because you put the thoughts there just from the point of view of Milky Way uh, as, I, as I talked in my uh, Paper, we do find um, uh, thin disk uh, stars with thin disk like kinematics that are very old. Uh, so, this uh, may be that people thinking that paradigm uh, where you know thin disk formed very late, uh, eight billion years, um, uh, had like a four, five, six billion years later, 
maybe uh, this results as yours as well is pointing that maybe that's not true. We could, we can have in this as early as you know first mm. couple of billion years. And I, th I, I think for, at least from Milky Way point of view and what our data is also showing that, that your conclusion uh, fits on that point. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering in the plot where you show your fraction and all the previous work fraction mm -hmm. between like Reggie 0.5 and one, if I remember, uh, yes. there's a lot of points that are like in the continuity of the HST points that you have, but that are really not consistent with the GWST values that you find. So it seems that uh, all these triangles are like really underestimating the actual bar fraction, maybe due to the resolution issue that you've shown. So uh, with GWST, do you have enough statistics to actually correct uh, the fraction between these redshifts? And since um, at this redshift, you have a better, uh, I mean, the bar that you're more able to see are gonna be like uh, maybe below the CPD kilobar settings. Could you like use the, um, uh, the distribution in size, like size of the bar divided by size of the disk, like look at the distribution of that at this redshift and maybe extrapolate to see how, uh, how much small bars are there compared to large bars and maybe like have an idea of how much underestimated, uh, I mean, what part of the small bars contributes to the total bar fractions? Yeah, yeah, they're interesting points. I think um, there have also been several studies uh, in the local universe that looks at much shorter bars and are finding ones at 1 to 1.2 kiloparsecs. And we can look at those bar fraction studies and see, extrapolate those as well um, to see those at higher redshift. So yeah, I'll, I'll definitely be looking into things like that. We have a question because uh, mm. we were told uh, for years that uh, high redshift galaxies were irregular, messy, and so on. What happened? <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's the bias? Uh, what were the mistakes made? A uh, large fraction of galaxies are hard. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting that we are finding a much higher bar fraction than what we, we thought we would find. Um, we still do see quite blobby. Um, clumpy galaxies at these high redshifts. Um, and we are finding quite high uh, fraction of irregular galaxies. I think in there, um, at the moment, we don't have a definition of irregular galaxies in JWST samples. So they use peculiars. The fraction here is among these galaxies or among all the galaxies? That's of... Um, this is the disks and spheroids yeah. in the whole, whole the irregulars are not uh, counted. So yeah. in, our, in our JWST sample, we only use disks. In our HST sample, there's a much more detailed classification in Carter Tepe in which they say irregular disky or irregular spheroid, and we yeah. include the irregular disky galaxies. Yeah. yeah. That's perhaps the source. If you yeah. include or exclude the irregulars. Can have a higher fraction of irregulars. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Before we leave for lunch, uh, I repeat once again that the appointment uh, at the museum is ten past five, not half past five, and also something else. Uh, there will be a link that is related to Francesca's tomorrow uh, hands-on workshop. Uh, you will find the link at the uh, conference webpage just below the poster. It will be later tonight there. And so please have it in mind just to consult it. Okay, 